clarifying questions during the December January period. Okay. Anyway, let's um let's start for I mean let's start with the first few questions tonight and Friday. I'm going to be streaming again. And we will definitely be able to finish this RI paper. Um, my aim is to try to do from question number one to seven. Hopefully, we can finish seven, and if there's enough time, maybe we can even move on to question number eight. So let's give this a quick try. Mm. Let's take a look at question number one together. It is a system of linear equation question. The little bit of inconvenience for this question that I notice is uh it are the numberings. You know, instead of giving you nice like two six, they give you negative one point two six point six. It is not exactly that bad. Yeah, but these are the little bit of inconveniences that I recognize from question to question. And it happens for almost all the questions that I've done so far. So for today, to, for tonight, question number one, all the way until seven, right? They sh I mean, we should experience, you know, this kind of design, you know, integrated into the question. So for question number one, let's, let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. We are given an equation. This is a system of linear equation question where we are supposed to form three equations to solve for A, B, C. So for, for the curve C, it has a stationary point of minus 1.2 and 6.6, .6, which means that at this point, it should satisfy the equation of the curve. At this point, dy dx must also be equal to 0. So if I am given y to be equal to, so I'm doing part 1. So I'm given y is equal to a over x to the power 3. Let me just rewrite. Maybe I'll rewrite it to a x to the power of minus 3 plus bx plus c. So let us come up with dy dx. And dy dx is going to be equal to minus 3 a x to the power of minus 4 plus b. Which I can also rewrite it as minus 3a over x to the power of 4. Then plus b so at the point minus 1.2 and 6.6 .6, it should satisfy this equation so at this point if i were to substitute x and y into these equations x and y we will be getting a uh, a over minus 1.2 to the power of 3 plus b b is uh, b times x so let me just read just directly write this as minus 1.2 b then plus c, this is equal to 6.6, .6, which I can definitely do a 1 divided by negative 1.2 cube. You can either leave it as decimal, or for me, I wrote it as a fraction, so that I can have the exact form. And I have this 1, 2, 5 over 2, 1, 6, a. Then minus 1.2b plus c, this is equal to 6.6. .6. This will form for me the first equation. And I know that at this point, dy dx is equal to 0. So dy dx is this. This tells me that minus 3a over negative 1.2 to the power of 4 plus b. This is equal to 0. And again, um, this I can either give it in terms of decimal. I will probably go for at least 5sf if I were to give it in terms of decimal. Then, um, but I'm writing it as just like this fraction, okay? So it's negative 6, 2, 5 over 4, 3, 2. This is what I've gotten. Plus A plus B, this is equal to 0. This forms for me equation number 2. And this curve C, I mean this graph C also passes through this point. So at the point 2.1 and negative 4.5. 2.1 and negative 4.5, so x is equal to 2.1. So we have a, a over 2.1 to the power of 3 um, plus 2.1 of b plus c. This is equal to negative 4.5. This divided by 2.1 cube. If I were to write it as fraction, I have 1000 over 9261a plus 2.1b plus c. This is equal to negative 4.5. This will form for me my third equation. And I just need to press all these three equations into my graphing calculator. So from my GC, I will be able to get the value for a, b, c. My a is 2.0 to one decimal place. 
B is minus 2.9 and C, C is equal to 1.9. Okay, so this is part one. A pretty okay question except that to me the inconvenience are the numbers that are given to us. Part two is pretty okay, I think. Part two, it is of the form where when x tends to infinity, when x tends to plus or minus infinity, this is going to become zero. So y will just start to adopt the behavior of this. And this is the definition for asymptotes for horizontal and oblique asymptote. So since the question has already given us a vertical asymptote, if I'm expected to code the other asymptote, the other asymptote will be y is equal to bx plus c. So my answer for part 2, which is well just one mark, will be b minus 2.9x plus c, so plus 1.9. Okay. How do I find, sorry, somebody is asking, uh, how do, <coughs> how do I find what? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not sure what are you referring to, you know, but uh, just now I was saying, right, in the beginning of the stream, probably some of you are still coming onto the stream. You know, I find this paper a pretty okay paper. You know, uh, but it is only pretty okay if, um, I, I was saying, if I were to imagine myself doing this paper as a revision, I will not be able to see how difficult this paper is. But when I try to review the questions that I've done so far, question number one to question number nine, I realize that for almost all the questions, you know, there are <clears throat> there are a little bit of um there are a little bit of uh sore points, there are a little bit of inconveniences here and there, which makes the question actually not as easily uh done you know in the exam. So I do think that this can be a potentially challenging paper for the students last year because they may not be able to do this paper as fast. Oh, how do I find the asymptotes? Okay, I'm not sure. Okay, there are a few things that I'm guessing, okay, that you guys are asking me what I'm, how I find. Um, if I were to try to press it into my graphing calculator, I would have gotten this. Let me show you my screenshot. So for these three equations, these three equations. So for this equation, this equation, and this equation, I will just press them into my graphing calculator and this is the answer that I've gotten. Okay, so A, B, C. It is in accordance to what I've gotten in my calculator. Mm. And yes, you can, I mean, if you, if Claire, if you plan to solve this a bit more manually, you can definitely try to sub equation number two into one and three, then solve them as uh, just maybe according to what you have written, right? Solve them as maybe just B and C. Okay, but why not just press all the three into, into, your, into your graphing calculator and let the calculator do the rest. As for asymptotes, right? Mm, I think some of you were asking about asymptotes. Okay, and, and I'm, I, I'm just curious, you know, is it easier? Okay, I, I didn't try myself, but I'll just press all the three into, uh, I'll just press all the three into my graphing calculator to let the calculator soft. So I, I'll try not to do too much calculation. And uh, I am going to, I, I mean, my aim is to try to do from question number one to question number seven. So I'll leave eight to 11 for, um, for Sunday. As for asymptotes, right? You know, I think some of you may be asking me how did I manage to deduce that a symptote is this. So, <clears throat> like in my tuition class, I was telling them that uh, if you happen to be struggling with questions that are related to asymptotes, okay, I have a suggestion to you, okay. Mm. <laughs> what? <clears throat> yay, yay as in like, uh, because... 1 to 7 are easy. I've tried 8 and 9, I thought they are okay also. It's just that they are longer. Especially uh, 10, I've not tried, but I realized 10 is like 14 marks or something. Um, <clears throat> by the way, for asymptotes, right, I would suggest that you go and take a look at uh, my theory outline for graphing techniques. In the very first part of graphing techniques, I defined asymptotes. At any point of time, if you are 
if you are trying to analyze asymptotes and you have problem, you know, like for example here, right, you don't really know what is asymptotes. My suggestion is you you make use of the definitions that I've wrote for asymptotes on the theory outline for graphing techniques. Okay, the very first part of graphing techniques at a, I mean just below the title, right? You will see my definition for vertical asymptote. Let me very quickly talk about it. Okay. So for vertical asymptote, the definition is the value of x that cause y to be undefined. I guess most of you should have gotten this since your secondary school. So what is the value of x that cause y to be undefined? When x is equal to 0, y will be undefined. But this is a, I mean, but for vertical asymptote, it has a different definition from oblique asymptote and for horizontal asymptote. For oblique and for horizontal asymptote, they share the same definition. It is the behavior of y when x tends to plus or minus infinity go check it out on, go check it out on the theory outline for graphing techniques on the Shivers tv where it is the behavior of y when x tends to plus or minus infinity so for example i look at this and i'm trying to analyze what is the horizontal or oblique asymptote since we have we have already gotten an uh, a vertical asymptote so the other asymptote should be either horizontal or oblique right so i ask myself what is going to be the behavior of y when x tends to plus or when x tends to plus or minus infinity. So when x tends to plus or minus infinity, this expression will become zero. So y will tend to the behavior of bx plus c. That's why y is going to be x plus c is the oblique asymptote. And that is also why, right, when you have an equation that is like this, for example, x squared minus 5x plus uh, 4 divided by let's say 3x minus 5. We will do a long division. And after you have done a long division, right, you will have something that is like ax plus b, then plus some kind of remainder over 3x minus 5. Why do we want to do a long division? Because after you have done a long division, you will get a format that is like this. And when x tends to plus or minus infinity, y will tend to the behavior of this. And that is why y is equal to ax plus b is the oblique asymptote. Well, this is the reason why you do a long division. Because in its original form, you were not able to analyze the behavior of y when x tends to plus or minus infinity. But after the long, divi after the long divided form, when x tends to plus or minus infinity, this becomes 0. So y will tend to ax plus b. Okay? So please take note of this, okay? When, especially when it comes to the A-level, um, definitions that are like this, that are very core to your understanding to the topic, will actually be way more important than you probably expect you know, have, uh, in your school's test or even the prelim. Okay, so please make sure that you clarify this and clear it out, okay? Next, question number two. Again, the I was saying you know, almost every question has a little bit of inconveniences. It, and, and it doesn't matter. I mean, and you may, may overlook this when you are doing this paper. Uh, as a as a just as a casual practice or revision it is when you are doing this during the exam I feel that it is way more possible right for this to become a more difficult paper than what some of us have expected it to be so for example this we can definitely try to for example make you the subject if I were to just do a bit of manipulation, you know, this is going to be 1 over 20 minus 1 over V, then uh, maybe I can rewrite this as V minus 20 over 20 V. So U is equal to this 20 V over V minus 20. From here, we can definitely find DU, D, sorry, DU, DV. Okay, once we have found DU, DV, we can sort of like use secondary school's strategy du dt is equal to maybe du dv times dv dt and so on you know, in order for us to find an equation that is connecting all this together but it is not necessary you know, like what i've been um promoting right what that what i've been um advocating for rate of change question that is like this we should try as much as possible to do um uh, an implicit differentiation with respect to t. So this is what I will suggest that you guys do, okay? It is way better. It will reduce all those inconveniences and sore points for this question more than if you were to stick to your secondary school's rate of change uh, equation. So what I'll do is this, 1 over u plus 1 over v, which is given to me as 1 over 20. Let's just differentiate both the left and right hand side with respect to t. So this. So if it is this, 
then uh, differentiating this, it will be minus 1 over u square, then du dt, then plus differentiating this, it will be minus 1 over v square dv dt, this is equal to 0. And immediately, I would have already gotten an equation that is connecting du dt, dv dt, u and v, where it is instant. You know, like what uh, some of you are suggesting, what, like one of, what, what one of you is suggesting, you know, you could have done it as a quadratic equation. This is even faster than doing it as a quadratic equation because I don't need to plan the equation before I execute the differentiation. That is the power of implicit differentiation. You can just differentiate with whatever that is uh, immediately available, like for example here. So then the question says, then the questions, I mean, I've already gotten mark, okay, once I've gotten this, you don't really, you, you are not expected to do much simplification. Given that u is a decrease, u is decreasing at a rate. So I know du dt, since it's decreasing, it is decreasing at a rate of 2. So du dt is equal to minus 2. I want to find the rate of increase of v when u is 60 units. So when u is 60 units. My aim is to try find the v dt. My aim is to try find this. And I know in this equation, in order for me to find this, I need the value for this, this, and this. Let's see what we have already gotten so far. u is equal to 60, so this I've already gotten settled. And um, we are also given that du dt, this is equal to minus 2. So since this is also given to us already, so du dt, this is also settled. We need v square, no problem, because we have an equation that relates u to v, and since we have u, so to find v, it is going to be 1 over u, sorry, u is 60, so it is, um, so it is 1 over um, 60 plus 1 over v, this is equal to 1 over 20. This will give us the value for v, uh, 1 over v is equal to 1 over 30. This tells me that v, v is equal to 30. So this is also settled, which means that now, this is the only unknown with all the rest of the values that I've gotten. Let's just substitute it into here. So negative 1 over 60 square. Then du dt, this is equal to minus 2. Minus 1 over v square. It is 1 over 30 square, or I can definitely write v as 30, then square. And dv dt. This is equal to 0, and I will be able to get dv dt immediately. dv dt here is going to be equal to half. Yep. I think this is easy, Claire. I do think this is easy. But like what I was saying, right, because of the way the equation is being given, if you want to make u in terms of v or v in terms of u, or if you want to come up with um, whatever other versions of the equation, that means you have to do one more step. That is why implicit differentiation is very, very useful for rate of change questions that are like this. In fact, for all rate of change questions, doing an implicit differentiation with respect to t is always going to be useful because you don't have to, you don't have to put in this extra effort to try to set the condition right before you start to differentiate. You can start to differentiate it almost instantly as long as you have all the quantities that you need to discuss. Okay, this is question number two. Let's take a look at three. Three really reminds me of one of the A-level question. And I see a, a pain point in question number three or so. The pain, I mean, it's not a major pain point, but the pain point in 3, I guess, is uh, this A that is here. Well, it is still not too bad, okay, but it is this A I, that I feel that maybe it's going to slow us down or, you know, algebraically, it is going to cause a little bit of inconveniences during the exam. So, <clears throat> we have this shape that is given to us. It is going to be folded, 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 folded to be form a shape that is like this. Um, this is x, so here it will also be x, which means that this distance here all the way until here, this distance here is going to be a minus 2x, which is going to be this distance. So here we have a, a minus 
x and as for the height this is a square so the height is going to be x so this here here okay this is x so we have to look at the volume and we are going to try to use differentiation to maximize this volume so the volume this is a square so it will be a minus 2x times a minus 2x so a minus 2x square multiply by x let's expand this so we have a, a square minus mm, minus 4ax plus 4x square multiply by x if I want to expand in let me let me write x square first okay so if I want to expand this we have a 4x to the power of 3 minus 4ax square plus a square x and this is v and we are supposed to maximize this so we will definitely try to differentiate this with respect to x since x is the variable a is the constant yep claire i really think implicit differentiation is a very, very powerful tool for differentiation where it is and, and i and i think claire you use a very good uh description here it is a tool where it is not just a technique it is not just something that we can be, we will just be tested on, but it is a tool that I do think that we can use to make use of our, I mean, to apply it to, into our applications of differentiation so that the whole process of application can be done better and more efficiently. So dv dx here is going to be equal to 12x squared minus 8ax plus a squared. And I am going to definitely let dv dx be equal to 0. So we have a 12x squared minus 8ax plus a squared. This is equal to 0. Mm, factorizing this, we have a 6, uh, 6x minus a. And we have a 2x minus a. This is equal to 0. This will give us a to be equal to a over 6. Or x can be equal to a over 2. x um, to be equal to a over 2, right? we will be rejecting. Why will we be rejecting? Because if x is equal to a over 2, if this x here is a over 2, we're going to have 2 times of a over 2 and a minus 2 times of a over 2 is equal to 0. There will be no volume at all. So this is definitely not going to get us a maximum so we're going to be using this and let's make sure that we check and clarify that we are getting a maximum when a when x is equal to a over 6 so this clarification this verification for maximum or minimum is necessary because the concept that we have used so far to derive at x is equal to a over 6 is dv dx is equal to 0 the concept that we are using is stationary point so, so far what we have understood is that when x is equal to a over 6, v is stationary. Which means that it can be a maximum point, minimum point or stationary point of inflection. Let's verify that it is none other than a maximum point. So let's try the square v dx square. I'm going to use the second derivative test. Differentiating this, we have a 24x minus 8a. So when x is equal to a over 6, when x is equal to a over 6, d square v over dx square. d square v dx square, this is going to be 24 of a over 6 minus 8a. Uh, this is 4a minus 8a, so it's minus 4a. a is a length, so a is going to be a positive number, which means that I'm seeing a negative value here. Therefore, we can now say that v is at its maximum and did the question ask us to find the maximum um find in terms of uh, yeah the question asks us to find the maximum possible v the maximum possible v i'm going to substitute this uh this a over six bank to here so we have four times of a over six cube minus four a of a over six square plus a square times a over 6. This is going to be equal to 2 over 27 of a cube. Very seemingly not a difficult question, but like what I was saying, 
Mm, maybe adding this A, you can cause some students to slow down or make some careless mistakes here and there. Where they could have very easily given a 10, maybe. You know, and that will make this question like way easier. Okay, so this question number three. Uh, yep, a maximum minimum question. It's still a short question. And I think the key to doing a paper that is like this is to make sure that we do it as fast as possible from the very beginning. Because, because like what one of you has just mentioned, the behind few questions are going to be a bit more difficult. And we should be expecting this kind of format in our prelim. So far, uh, for those schools that, are, that have already had their paper one, right? Where the first few questions are always easy, uh, have been easier. And then the second, I mean, the maybe the last one third of the paper, it suddenly becomes more difficult or more tedious. So let's make sure that we try to do this kind of question faster, okay? Especially when it is easy enough, let's make sure that we do it faster also during your promo. I don't promo, <laughs> during your prelim. Okay, J1s are having the promo. So most of you are probably uh, J2, so prelim, prelim. Um, we have curve C that is given to us in a parametric form. Part 1. The coordinates, uh, we want to find the coordinates of A, which is, ten, which is uh, where the tangent to C is parallel to the x-axis. Like what I told you, right, I did find some students uh, making like unnecessary mistake when the question says that the tangent is parallel to the x-axis or when the tangent is parallel to the y-axis. So the other day I was suggesting maybe just do a quick sketch, you know, to see for yourself, right, what is parallel to the x-axis, what is parallel to the y-axis. So if it is parallel to the x-axis, it should be something that is like this. So, you know, the dy dx must be equal to zero. So let's find dy dx for part one and let it be equal to zero and make use of that to help us to solve for the coordinates of A. So from here, let us find dx dt. dx dt here is going to be two of 1 plus t to the power of 1, uh, chain rule then multiply by 1, so that's it. And dy dt, dy dt is going to be uh, 2 times 2, 4. Then 1 minus t to the power of um, 1 minus t to the power of 1, then chain rule minus 1. And I'll probably write this as 4 times of t minus 1. So from here, we can deduce dy dx, which is dy dt divided by dx dt. So 4 of t minus 1 divided by 2 times of 1 plus t. And this is equal to 2 of t minus 1 divided by 1 plus t. Mm -hmm. And since the question says that uh, the tangent is parallel to the x-axis, we can see the tangent which is parallel to the x-axis is horizontal so we are going to be letting dy dx be equal to zero. So if dy dx is equal to zero, that means two of t minus one divided by one plus t, this is equal to zero. So this tells me that t must be equal to one, right? The numerator must be equal to one in this case. Mm, so when t is equal to one, we can then substitute it back into x and y to find the corresponding coordinates of a. So when t is equal to 1, x is going to be equal to 1 plus 1 squared. So 2 squared, this is 4. And y is going to be 2 of 1 minus 1 squared, which is equal to 0. So the coordinates of a is 4, 0. So we know that this a is actually lying directly on the x-axis. So let me write down a, a is 4, 0. Then part 2. Part 2 is where I once again see this little bit of a sore point or inconvenience that is designed and integrated into the question so that although it doesn't seem very difficult but you know these are the points where it stops the flow of you know something that is supposedly easier which is this d here. You know y is equal to minus x plus d and it is a line that intersects the curve C at the point A. In order for us to find the coordinates of B, we need to first find a value for D. So to do that, mm, let me do a bit of imagination, okay? So this is a line that passes through A. Okay, maybe let me just draw it again. 
So now we know that the curve uh, the x-axis is going to pass through the point A which has a coordinate of 4, 0. Mm -hmm. And this line that the question just mentioned is a line that is going to pass through point A. So it's going to be passing through this, which means that it's going to be cutting at B. And this line that is given to us is the line Y is equal to negative X plus D. We can solve for D because A lies on this line. So I know at the point A, 4, 0 must satisfy this equation. So 0 is going to be equal to minus 4 plus D. This tells me that D must be equal to 4. So we know that the equation of the line now is Y is equal to minus X plus 4. Let me call this equation number 3. And I'm going to call this and this equation number 1 and 2. Okay, maybe I should just write this down here also. So um, X is equal to 1 plus T squared. This will be my equation number 1. And Y is equal to 1 minus, sorry, 2 times of 1 minus T squared. This is equation number 2. You know, this forms for me the graph, the curve. And this forms for me the line, which means that at A, B, all the three equations must, ha must happen simultaneously. You know, all the three relationships must happen at the same time. So I'm going to substitute equation number one and equation number two. Use GC. Mm. I, I don't get what um, which part is uh, the part that we are going to be using GC and, and other than substituting the values in. Because we cannot use GC to solve these three equations because they are non-linear. Our GC can help us to solve linear sim uh, simultaneous equation. But for non-linear, we still got to do it a bit more algebraically. So I'm going to sub equation number 1 and 2 into equation number 3. Okay, so they are happening simultaneously. So if I were to sub 2 into here, we have a 2 of 1 minus t squared. This is equal to minus x, so 1 plus t squared plus 4. Let me bring everything over to the left hand side. So this is 1 minus, if I were to expand this, I have a 2t plus t squared. Moving this over to the left hand side, plus 1 plus 2t plus t squared, then minus 4. This is equal to 0. Mm -hmm. We will have a 2t squared plus t squared. So we have a 3t square, then a minus 4t, minus 4t plus 2t, we will have a minus 2t. Then 2 minus, uh, 2 plus 1 minus 4. So this gives me a minus 1. This is equal to 0. Mm, factorizing this, t minus 1 and uh, 3t plus 1. Okay, this will be equal to 0. This tells me that t is equal to 1, which is expected because that is where a happened when t is equal to 1 or t is equal to minus 1 over 3. So we, are be, we will be making use of t is equal to minus 1 over 3 because this is where the point b will be. So for the point b, I know t. So I can substitute this t back into equation number 1 and equation number 2. For, okay, so I'll substitute this back into equation 1 and 2 to solve for x and y. So x is going to be equal to 1 minus 1 over 3 square. So we have a 2 over 3 square. This is 4 over 9. And y, y is 2 of uh, 1 minus minus 1 over 3, so plus 2 over 3 square. This is equal to 32 over 9. So therefore, we found the coordinates of B and that is 4 over 9 and 32 over 9. And the last part, part 3, is very, very simple. <laughs> we are supposed to find the area that is formed by the triangle uh, that where the vertices are A, B and the origin. A, B and the origin. Um, it will be something that is like this.
the origin. Um, point A will be on the x-axis, so 4, 0. And point B, we have just found it is 4 over 9 and 32 over 9. So for part 3, the area of um, triangle OAB. This area will be half of base. Base is 4. So half of base times height. Height, it will be this. And that will be the y coordinate of B. So this times this times 32 over 9. And this is equal to 64 over 9. Okay, it is still an okay question. Yep. Mm, yeah, I don't think I have anything much to say about this. Um, let's move on. Okay, let's take a look at question number 5. And what is that little bit of saw point in question number 5? I, I don't know, you know what, <clears throat> how you guys perceive question number 5, but again, if I were to imagine myself as a student um, you know, doing this during the prelim last year, right? Then seeing this curve is just very uncomfortable because it is a non-standard curve and we are looking at the curve with uh with uh this volume volume of Descartes. Okay, I'm not very sure how to pronounce this, so I think it's volume of Descartes. Um <clears throat> you know something that is not very familiar. So again, you know, this is where the saw point the little bit of saw point comes in, but it doesn't matter. Let's just react to what the question is telling us. So for part one. Part one. Mm, we are given this, this cube plus y cube. This is equal to 3ax times y. And a is a positive constant. And um, we see an oblique asymptote that is here. So y is equal to minus a minus, sorry, minus x minus a. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is given to us as 0, 0 is a stationary point. We can see it here also. 0, 0 is a stationary point. I want to find in terms of A the coordinates of the other stationary point, which I can also see. The other stationary point should be here. Right? So if I'm supposed to be finding the coordinates of this other stationary point, I will be expecting the X coordinate to be positive and Y coordinate to be positive also. So I'm going to find dy dx and let dy dx be equal to 0. So from here, let's try to differentiate with respect to x. So this, x to the power of 3 plus y to the power of 3. Then I will differentiate this with respect to x also, 3axy. So this is going to be 3x squared plus 3y squared dy dx. This is going to be equal to 3ax product rule. Let me differentiate y, which will give me a dy dx plus uh, 3ay, because differentiating x is 1. Let me bring this over to the right hand side, which will give me a 3ax dy dx, then minus away 3y square dy dx. This is going to be equal to 3x square. Then this bring it over to the left hand side minus 3ay. All the 3s can be cancelled. I should have already cancelled them. I mean I should have cancelled them in the previous um previous line. But anyway, I'm going to just cancel them. Okay, so I have uh, this minus y square of dy dx. This is equal to x square minus ay. This gives me dy dx. And dy dx is x squared minus ay, this divided by ax minus y squared. Okay, so this is, this is uh, dy dx. And since we are looking for stationary point, we are going to be letting dy dx be equal to 0. Strange. It just suddenly occurred to me that we have done this dy dx is equal to 0 for this. Is this the third time or fourth time in the last five question? I guess for some reason they really, really favor stationary points um, in the first part of the paper. So dy dx is equal to 0. So we have uh, x squared minus ay 
divided by ax minus y squared. This is equal to zero, so the numerator is equal to zero. Um, and I guess it's easier for us to make y the subject. So y is going to be equal to x squared over a. And I'm going to substitute this uh, back into this equation here. So if I were to call this, let's say, equation number 1. And equation number 2, I will go for uh, x to the power of 3 plus y cubed. This is equal to 3axy. Equation number 2. So let's put equation number 1 into equation number 2. Mm -hmm. That will be x to the power of 3 plus y cubed. So x square over a to the power of 3. This is equal to 3ax multiplied by y, which is x square over a. You guys find that it is a weird graph? Uh, because I can see that some, some of you think that it is a ribbon. It didn't occur to me that it's a ribbon. I mean, to me, when I was doing this, I thought it was just a graph. Yeah, but you're right. Now that I look at it again, uh, the transform graph in part two does look a little bit like a ribbon. Uh, I, I, I've not really heard of Descartes, but I've seen this curve before. In fact, I think um, 2018 or 2017, NYJC also used a curve that was like this. I think you guys can go and check it out or if, are there any of you who are from NYJC because I'm, I'm pretty sure it, it came out in NYJC but I can't really remember which year that was. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is going to get me uh, this to the power of 6 over a to the power of 3. Then um, this AA can be cancelled so I have uh, x to the power of 3. Bring it over to the left hand side, it will be 1 minus 3 x to the power of 3. That will give me a minus 2x uh, cubed. This is equal to 0. If I were to factorize our x to the power of 3, then I will have uh, x to the power of 3 over a to the power of 3 minus 2. This is equal to 0. And um, x definitely can be equal to 0. Or x to the power of 3 over a cubed minus 2 is going to be equal to 0 x is equal to 0 is this point at the origin, which is what the question already mentioned. We are supposed to find the other one. So from here, x to the power of 3, this is going to be equal to uh, 2a cubed, which means that x is going to be 2 to the power of 1 over 3a. Okay, great. It is a positive number, exactly according to what we have expected because we are expecting the, the other stationary point to be in the first quadrant. So it has a positive x coordinate. And as for the y, y is this, substituting this back into equation number 1, we have a 2 to the power of 1 over 3a, then square divided by a. So we have a 2 to the power of 2 over 3a square divided by this, this is a. Um, the coordinates of the other stationary point, okay, now we have gotten it. The coordinate of the other stationary point will be 2 to the power of 1 over 3a, and 2 to the power of 2 over 3a. Let me write it down here. Oh, um, hang on, I don't think we'll be using it. Will we be using it? Yeah, I think we will. Sorry. So let me write down the coordinate of the stationary point here. 2 to the power of 1 over 3a. Then 2 to the power of 2 over 3a. We're not the... <coughs> not the oh, NJC did this also. Yeah, I, I sort of like remember remember um the NYJC question because it was the first time I saw this volume of the cut curve. And I thought it was very interesting looking. It probably follows some kind of pattern. I've never learned this or heard about this before. So when it came out in NYJC, because I have, I have students from NYJC, so when they show me the paper, I was like, somehow this just left me with that impression. Uh so anyway, this is part one. Okay, and we have gotten the coordinates of the stationary point. Part two, we are supposed to. Part two, we are supposed to let it undergo this transformation. 
we replace all the x by modulus of x, right? From here, from here to here. Okay, we replace, let me write it down. So we replace x by modulus of x. So which means that this part is going to remain. Where this part is going to remain, and this part will disappear. Whatever that is on this part, it is going to be reflected over to the other side. Okay, that is why one of you was saying that um, this looks like a ribbon. Sketching this from the GC. Uh, how do you actually sketch this on your GC? Because if you were to sketch this on your GC, you need to make Y the subject. Is it possible to make Y the subject? Uh, algebraically, I'm not very sure how Y can be made into the subject. Because if it is if it is not possible, then I don't think you can press this into your GC. But I, I did try to use some um, some web app to draw this graph before before our live session today. <laughs> you know, so because I was just curious, um, I, I'm going to be reflecting this line y is equal to minus x minus a. So I was curious when I'm trying to reflect this, right? So I was trying to do a check whether it is going to be cutting this. So it is not going to be cutting, you know, because I've just I've checked then I and then I realized. But I'm I'm not sure. I was trying to I mean I look at this, I know I cannot possibly draw this onto my GC. That's why I use a web app to, to actually sketch out this graph for me to see whether this this of this reflected oblique asymptote is going to be cutting the graph. So anyway, my answer will be for part two will be something that is like this. The y-axis. the x-axis um, so this part is going to remain so let me sketch in the asymptotes first so we have an oblique asymptote like what I told you guys for since a few weeks back during our live stream right that my suggestion is to is to um, sketch in the asymptotes first before we sketch in the rest of the parts of the graph so minus x minus a where it is this oblique asymptote which is affecting this part of the graph so my graph is going to be something that is like this. I guess this is the ribbon that one of you was talking about. Then from here, it will tend towards the asymptote. And, what, and I want to really make sure that my graph tends towards the asymptote and not touching the asymptote. Wow, that was close. So I have this. And um, this is going to be reflected. Oh, I need to indicate this point also. This point here is 2 to the power of 1 over 3a and 2 to the power of 2 over 3a. Okay, the, the stationary point. And the oblique asymptote is going to be reflected. So it is this. And I have this. This will be the line y is equal to replacing x by minus x. It will be minus minus x, so x minus a. Mm, my reflected graph will look something that is like this. So here, I guess this is where the ribbon lies. So the other part here is going to be tending towards the asymptote. And the maximum possible point here will be minus 2 to the power of 1 over 3a and a 2 to the power of 2 over 3a. Okay, so this is going to be our graph of modulus of x to the power of 3 plus y to the power of 3. This is equal to 3a modulus of x times y. Okay. Next. Well, we are already at question number six. I think there's a chance that we can actually do question number uh, eight. So we are already at question number six. So six and seven, then I think maybe we will get a chance to do eight or so. That will give us more time to discuss and try uh, nine to 11 on Friday. Six, mm. I do see the inconvenience about six or so. Algebraically, it is, it is a little bit more inconvenient. And for part B, we got to do a bit of manipulations to this equation and this expression and this expression before we can apply the method of difference and to hence you know, using this result to find this result. So these are the little bit of inconveniences that I think students will be facing during the exam. Um, it is not about just getting the answers. These inconveniences actually slows us down and probably 
make us doubt our solution a little bit sometimes. So let's try A first. A, we are supposed to sum from R is equal to M plus 1 all the way until 2N of R, R minus 1 which I am going to rewrite this as summing from m plus 1 all the way until 2n of r square minus r. And I'm doing this because I have the result for r square. So this is going to be summation from r is equal to m plus 1 all the way until 2n of r square minus away sum from uh, r is equal to m plus 1 all the way until 2n of r. So to apply this result, Let's try to break up this summation into two parts. Um, I'm going to start from 1, since here starts from 1, and I'll end at 2n of r square. Then I will minus away r starting from 1, all the way until n. So from 1 all the way until 2n minus away 1 all the way until n will leave me with an n plus 1 all the way until 2n. So and both of this, I can actually make use of this. Except that for the first one, I will replace all the n by 2n. Other than that, you know, the result that is given to us will be applicable to this. As for this, it depends on your perspective of looking at it. One, way, one good way of looking at this is to expand this and you will see it as an AP. So expanding this, the first term is going to be m plus 1. And the next, ter next term will be n plus 2. Then after that, it will be n plus 3 and all the way until the last term is uh, 2n. Okay, so for this, this is 1 over 6 of 2n, then um, 2n plus 1. Then after that, 2, replacing n by 2n, we will have a 4n plus 1. Okay, 2 times 2n, so 4n plus 1. Minus away, this is going to be 1 over 6 of n, n plus 1, and a 2n plus 1. Then minus away this, which is a sum of an AP. We minus away this, this is a sum of an AP, where the number of terms in this AP here, the number of terms is going to be 2n minus away n plus 1 plus 1. So the number of terms will be 2n minus n is n, then minus 1 plus 1, this is n. Um, I see one of you were asking about, oh, hello, Smiley. Uh, okay, I recognize your, <laughs> I recognize you now. So how did I break up the n plus 1? For example, if I were to sum from r is equal to 5 all the way until 10 of this. Where I can rewrite this as sum from r equal to uh, 1 to 10 minus away sum from 1 to 4, correct? And then I will get from I'll get from 5 all the way until 10. This is one way that you can see it. Another very good way for us to view summation. Okay, I mean and, and I think this is actually a very, very powerful tool also. When you're looking at a summation question and you are not very sure. Yep, you can also use the standard form for summation to, to, for this, to apply to this, okay, no problem. A very powerful tool that, that you can make use of right, for summation, when you try to rewrite into this form, is to not use the sigma notation at all. Okay, it is a little bit more troublesome, but you think about it, right? If I were to be doing this, okay, 1 to 10, that means it will be f1 plus f2 plus all the way until um, f4, then f5, then all the way until f10, correct? So this is 1 all the way until f10, that is this, this expression here. But if I want to have 5 all the way until 10, I'm going to minus off this, so that I can have 5 all the way until 10, right? So what is this? This is 1 to 4, which was what I did here. So if I were to do a 1 to 2n, and I'll minus away 1 to n, you will leave me with a n plus 1 all the way until 2n. Okay, and that is if I can try to see summation as the individual addition. So anyway, this will become this, this will become this, and as for this, I'm going to use the sum of a uh, AP formula, the number of terms which is n divided by 2, and then the first term, n plus 1, plus the last term, which is 2n. 
Okay, n plus 1 is the first term, last term is 2n. Mm, we got to simplify this. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take out 1 over 6n, which will leave me with a 2 of 2n plus 1, then 4n plus 1. Then minus away, this is n plus 1, then 2n plus 1. Minus away this, this will be a uh, 3 of uh, n plus 2n, this is 3n, n plus 1, this. So I have a 1 over 6n, then it will be this, uh, this times this is going to be 8n square times 2, 16n square. Then we will have a 2n, then 4n, 6n times 2, this will be 12n, 1 times 1, 1 times 2, 2. Minus away this times this is going to be give, giving me a 2n square. Then this times this and 3n. So minus 3n. Then 1 times 1 minus 1. So and then minus away 9n minus 3. So this will be 1 over 6n. Um <clears throat> let's see. Uh this, this, this can be cancelled. This is uh this minus this is going to be 14n square. 2 minus 1 is going to be minus 1 minus 3. This is going to be equal to, sorry, this minus 3 this is going to be minus 2. So 2, if I were to factorize out, I will have a 1 over 3n of 7n squared minus 1. Okay, this is going to be my simplified version for part A. Next, part B. Part B, we are supposed to be making use of the method of difference. And we are given one single expression. The method of difference never comes with just one single expression. And ideally, there should be one expression minus another expression. I've, I've seen before that it is one plus another expression. Okay, then I, I, I don't want to confuse you guys. Okay, so anyway, um, so we, we probably should try to break this up. So there will be a little bit of try and error and manipulation in the process. And this is the inconvenience or sore point that I see in this question number six. So let's do a little bit of trial, okay? We have um we have a summation from r starting from one. We are doing part one. Star starting from one all the way until n of r plus one minus e r divided by e to the power of r. And this, I'm going to break it up into this divided by this and this divided by this. And let's see whether it is going to work. So it will be r plus 1 divided by er minus er divided by, sorry, minus uh, e to the power of r. e to the power of r divided by er. e to the power, oh, sorry, it is er. My mistake. So it is indeed e r divided by e to the power of r which i am going to rewrite it again i can really see the possibility of how the method of difference can work already because i have r plus 1 e to the power of r here and this if i were to just bring the e to the denominator we will have a r divided by e to the power of r minus 1 where they look like very very similar terms but the r is just one plus or minus the other which means that if I were to now do a method of difference or to expand this, when r is equal to 1, we have a 1 plus 1, 2 over e to the power of 1. Then minus away 1 over e to the power of 0. e to the power of 0 is 1. Plus when r is equal to 2, 2 plus 1, this is 3. Divided by e to the power of 2. Minus away r is equal to 2. So here will be 2 divided by e to the power of 1. Uh, 2 minus 1, so e to the power of 1. So we can see uh, two terms that can be subtracted already. Let's continue first so that we can see a pattern of cancellation. And when r is equal to 1, 2, 3, when r is equal to 3, this will be 4 divided by e to the power of 3. Then minus away 3 divided by e to the power of 2. So we can see this cancellation. And the cancellation continues. Two rows gives me one cancellation. So let me try to write down the last two rows. The second last row will be when r is equal to n minus 1. So n minus 1 plus 1 is n divided by e to the power of n minus 1 minus n minus 1 divided by e to the power of n minus 1 minus 1 n minus 2. 
then plus um, the last term, it is when r is equal to n, so that will be n plus 1 divided by e to the power of n minus away n divided by e to the power of n minus 1, and we can see the same pattern of cancellation. And although we cannot manually cancel every single one of the terms, but through pattern recognition, we can see that in between terms are all going to be cancelled, which will leave us with uh, this n plus 1 divided by e to the power of n minus 1 over e to the power 0, e to the power 0 is 1, so minus 1. This gives us our answer for this. This is n plus 1 divided by e to the power of n minus 1. And hence, we are supposed to be making use of this result to find this. Let me erase this first. Okay, hence, we are going to be making use of this result to find this. And remember, we have done this before and I was telling you that I have a result that is in the in the on the second page of the summation theory outline on Achievers TV that tells you that gives you a result that you can actually make use of for this particular question, which is this. When we try to sum from r is equal to m to let's say n of f r, this we can rewrite it as if I were to replace r by r plus p, then here we will minus p, we'll replace all the r by r plus p. It is a result that is very, very useful for a question that is like this. But we cannot immediately apply it unless we overcome this saw point first, which is to manipulate this so that it looks a little bit more similar to the expression that I have here. So if I were to sum from r is equal to 2 all the way until n of e plus r minus e r, this divided by e to the power of r minus 1. Okay, if I were to sum this, then uh, I, I'm going to try to reorganize this, okay? And if you were to ask me, I'm going to try to put this E and E together as one term. And this is what I'm going to try to do. So, um, R, I'll let it be. Minus, I'm going to keep it as minus because there's a minus here. So, minus E. If I were to factorize out E from this R, I will have R. And then this e is supposed to become a minus uh, 1, right? Minus e times minus 1 will give me an e. So I have this divided by e to the power of r minus 1. And I can see if I can just replace all this r here, all this r here, and this r over here, right? If I can replace all this r here by r plus 1, then I will be getting this, this, I'll be getting this, and this, r plus 1 minus 1, I'll be getting r. So I'm going to be applying this now. So replacing r by r plus 1 to 2. Then on top, I will minus 1. Then here it will be r plus 1 minus e. Replacing r by r plus 1, r plus 1 minus 1, it will be r. Divided by e to the power of r plus 1 minus 1, it will be r. So I have this. And this is going to be some plus 1, I bring it over to the other side, this is 1, to m minus 1 of r plus 1 minus er divided by er. And now I have an expression that is within the summation that is exactly the same as this. The only difference is n is going to be replaced by m minus 1. So I'm going to replace all this result here, all the n's that is in this result here by my m minus 1. So m minus 1 plus 1 divided by e to the power of n minus 1 minus 1 this is equal to n over e to the power of n minus 1 minus 1 okay this is question number six it's also an easy question and for some of you who have not uh, gotten to know this please make sure that you take a look at um, your school's notes or take a look at the, the summation theory outline on the Chivers TV where you will see this result Okay, it is a very, very useful result. And one more tip that I want to give you guys is if you are applying this result, please try not to apply it to something that you have already evaluated. Okay, don't apply this to whatever that you have already evaluated. If you are going to be evaluating this, apply this to what you are going to evaluate. Hmm? 
Isn't this my answer? Yep, this is my answer. We n over e to the power n minus 1 minus 1. Ri hat. If somebody was is saying that Ri had an n on top. Okay, I'm not very sure what it means by Ri had an n on top because uh just yes, here is also an n on top, so I'm not very sure. Okay, so so anyway, this is my final answer. Uh, yep, I don't think there's anything wrong with this, so I'm going to just keep to this. Okay, so this will be my final answer. Mm, next, let's take a look at question number seven. Why replace Why replace to r plus one? Let me try to understand the question that some of you are asking. Why m minus 1? Oh, because of this, I'm applying this. So if I were to replace r by r plus p, if I were to replace by r plus p, then on top I will minus p. So if I were to plus 1, on top I will do a minus 1. This is actually very, very easy to prove. There's an e on top. Mm. Oh. As in like, if you, want, if you want to just manipulate this to bring the e, e to the top, it is also fine. So e to the power n, e to the power minus 1, minus 1. Then this e to the power minus 1, you can definitely bring it to the top. So it will be n e divided by e to the power n, minus 1. They are the same thing. But for, for some of you who uh, ask about, about this, right? You know, the other day, I remember we were trying to prove this, which is very, very easy also. Now what I was telling you, let me just very quickly prove it again, okay? Um, if I have, let's say, let, let me go for a simpler example. Let's say I start from 1 all the way until n of f r. When you're dealing with a summation, like what I just mentioned, right? If you have problem, you know, understanding it from the, from the perspective of sig the sigma notation, okay, one very powerful tool is to actually expand the summation and try to see it as the plus 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 so that you manipulate from the plus plus plus. Please remember this, okay? It sounds very simple, but it is really very, very powerful. Let me show you how I can very easily prove why this rule holds, okay, why I can do something that is like from here to here, by just expanding and doing a very simple manipulation. If I were to expand this, this is F1 plus F2 plus F3 plus all the way until Fn. Let's do a very simple um, manipulation to 1. So how about going for 1 minus p plus p. Okay, I'll do the same thing for 2. I'll do a minus p plus p. And all the way until the very last term, I will do a minus p. Sorry, p is n. So I'll do a minus p plus p. And I'm going to now reference the new r as this. This. All the way until the very last r is this, which means that if I were to rewrite this in terms of a summation notation, I can rewrite this as r starting from 1 minus p, all right? r starting from 1 minus p, all the way until the last r is going to be n minus p, and the function right will appear as r plus p. So for the very first r, I'm going to replace this r by r minus p, then plus p is this. The second one is going to be 2 minus p, then plus p, which is this, all the way until the very last one. Okay? So, once I've gotten this, if I were to bring this p over to the left-hand side, so sum from r plus p, this is equal to 1, all the way until m minus p of f r plus p. Okay, so, I can see this happening way in here. So, this is exactly the same as this through my manipulation. And how do you know that you are supposed to replace r by something Okay, number one, this is definitely from observation. It is not a rule that I can give you, but one trigger point for you to recognize that it is going to be replacing r by r plus p is to see expression. Like for example, I look at this expression after I've manipulated. Okay, after you have manipulated, you look at this expression, it looks it looks sort of like this, correct? Right? It looks sort of like this, and then you're going to do a little bit of your own try and error. What if I were to replace this r by r plus 2? How do you know, how do you know that it is this? Because we have just talked about it. A few weeks ago, we talked about this strategy of replacing r by r plus p. So it is a strategy that you already know. You don't have to try to react to it on the spot during the exam because this is one of the other tools. 
they can carry it with you for summation. So we know we can replace r by r plus p looking at this, although this is different from this. But what if I were to replace this r? What can I replace this r with? If you think about it, it should be replacing r by r plus 1, correct? Oh, okay. Uh, one of you were asking about this. Yeah, we, we are... We are going to be organizing this paper two intensive revision. Um, in fact, the link is if you're on the Chivers TV page, right? If you are watching the live stream from the from the uh, online.achievers.com slash live, you will if you scroll down a little bit, you will see you will see a, a, a banner that talks about this paper two live uh, paper two intensive revision workshop on the 5th of November. But if you guys go and take a look at it, right? The the details are actually on that page. So we have given we have given the details, we have given the, the prices that we are charging. In fact, now we are running it with a early bird discount. You know, so so you can go and check it out. You know, if if you if you make a purchase uh this month, the prices are actually pretty cheap. You know, so so I'll suggest you guys if you are interested, right? Gather some friends, you know, uh then you can enjoy the, the friends discount and also the early bird discount. Um, we will be organizing it to be on the 5th of November, which is the day that, that is before your paper 2. So hopefully, um, I mean, I will definitely be revising statistics. You know, some of the things that I'll be doing has already been listed on the website, uh, on, on the page. So what I'll be planning to do, right, is I'm going to be revising all the topics on statistics. But because statistics is pretty simple to like revise from topics to topics, so I also want to try to talk a little bit about some of the tips that I think are going to be very, very useful for uh, different topics. So I'll be sharing some tips. We will be doing some uh, questions, provided that those questions allow me to enhance you know, the tips that I'm going to talk about. Because we are going to be running it for two and a half hours from 4 to 6.30, so it will be pretty condensed. Because I also hope that whoever attends this, right, will get a chance to continue to do at least one or two more paper two in in the evening, you know, before you sleep and then prepare for the next day. So, so I will be doing. I will definitely be doing the all the statistics topics, excluding correlation and linear regression, because you are not tested up on it. And then, um, I will try to go through some pure math, but I don't think there's going to be a lot of time to go through that many pure math. Uh, but I'll be ho hopefully I will be able to get some pure math uh, papers. I'm not sure whether it is possible. Um, but if I can get hold of some pure math, I mean of paper one from my students uh, after your paper one, right? Then I will. I mean then I can probably do a bit of prediction of uh, what is going to be potentially coming out in section A of uh, of paper two. Then if we already know some of the pure math topics that are going to be coming out in paper two, if there were to be some tips that I can share for pure math, I also want to spend some time to talk about them also. Okay, but the bulk of the time will probably be spending on statistics because that is uh that is something that I'm I'm very sure I know is gonna come out in paper two, okay? It is just the the whether I'll be able to get access to paper one that is uh that I think no one can be sure. Yeah, especially when the format is when you're going to be submitting the script together with the question. You know, like two years ago, this, this was the, not the format. Two years ago, you will, you will be able to keep the question paper. So I would definitely have access to the question in paper one. But uh, since last year, they have changed, so I'm not very sure. What you get access to it? You, yeah, last year I get access to it. <laughs> you know, so, so last year, um, there are people who actually shared the paper one. So my students sent it to me, so I saw the question in paper one. So I so I did share also you know, what are the topics that can potentially come out in paper two. I said like what are the pure math topics that can potentially come out in paper two? Because um it, it is not like uh how how do I put it? It's not like you know whatever that comes out in paper two, right? Is not like topical, you know. Like for example, if a topic, I mean, if a topic has already come out in paper one, but within a topic there are actually parts. So if certain parts of a topic ap appear in paper one, that topic can still appear in paper two, can may still appear. Although the chances are lower, but it may still appear in paper two. It is just another part of the topic that will appear. For example, right? For example, if you if you were to see McLaurin's as one topic, 
Then in paper one, they they have already tested you on um the differentiation part of McLaurin's. Then in paper two, they may actually still test you on the binomial expansion part of McLaurin's. You know, and, and if uh, differentiation rate of change has really come out in paper one, then maximum minimum may still come out as uh, in paper two. Get more sleep. Hang on. Okay, I'm not sure whether you have misunderstood. You know, it is it is four p.m. to six thirty p.m. Okay, this the the intensive revision that I'm planning right is six is four p.m. in the afternoon to six thirty p.m. It is not four a.m. to six thirty a.m. Then after that, you know, immediately leave house and then head to your eight a.m. uh paper two. Okay, that's not the case. So uh, I I will still have quite a lot of sleep. Okay, and, and I really want you guys to make sure that you have proper sleep before your paper two also. So, so I'm hoping that you can see, <clears throat> you're able to see the... Yeah, who will do a 4 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. That, uh, that is very, very intense, okay? So <clears throat> anyway, uh, the you guys should, should be able to see the banner, right? Let me write down... Let me let me write it down here, okay. Uh let me see. The URL is this. Mm. Let me just very quickly write down the URL here. So do go and check it out, okay? It is um online dot achievers dot com slash slash uh, paper two workshop paper two workshop okay i think it is going to be very very useful and i hope you guys can consider wow are you sure 4 a.m class sounds fun <laughs> 4 a.m. class sounds fun. Hmm, maybe. I've never conducted a 4 a.m. class before. So, but it does sound interesting and exciting. Um, I mean, I'm assuming you, you mean uh, the day that is before your exam, right? Uh, I, for me, right? I will always make sure that I'm over prepared. So I'm pretty calm before the night before the exam. I'm, I'm really seriously pretty calm the night that is before exam. And usually I'll just try to sleep by like 10 plus 11 if I have a morning paper the next day. And uh, but I, I do get a bit nervous before I mean sitting down in the exam hall before I get the paper. But the moment when I get the paper, I'll just immediately i mean i will immediately calm myself down because i know if i'm going to do a paper well like for example this ri paper if i were to be receiving a paper that is of this kind of format you know i know the more when i receive the paper the more when i can start writing right i really really need to make sure that i write very very fast okay from the very beginning as long as i can do the the question i should get it done as soon as possible because i will always be expecting a more tedious or more difficult question later Okay, it seems like uh, there are a lot of people who are suggesting 4 a.m. class. <laughs> wow, okay, I'm, I'm proud of you guys, okay, that you are willing to sacrifice your sleep you know, and wake up at 4 a.m. to do a workshop for your paper too. Okay, that is, uh, that is impressive, okay. But I'm going to, I'm going to stick to 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. And uh, I just need to let you guys know again, okay, there's a early bird discount for this month. Next month, it will revert back to the usual price. Um, so if you guys are interested, hopefully you guys are, okay, gather some of your friends, you know, to go and attend my workshop, okay, on the 5th of November, where, we, where I will be discussing statistics. And hopefully, I will be able to get the, I mean, if, if someone were to have paper one, I will, I should be able to get the paper one. So hopefully we can also talk a little bit about paper one. We have some of the things that may come up in paper one 
that uh, we can probably try to watch out for first before you guys go for your paper two on the 6th of November. Okay, we have talked a little bit too much. I guess we will stop at question number seven. Oh, uh, <clears throat> for my regular tuition class, right, I will be talking to them uh, this week. So I'll let them know what is the plan for them. For group sign up, right, if you were to click and go to the Achiever store, then um, <clears throat> you will see uh you sign i mean you'll see options to sign up for one person two people three and four um if you buy for example three we will i mean after you've made the purchase the system will be sending you uh an access key a url so with this url you will be able to admit three people so once the once three people are admitted on that day right then the url will be i mean that that key will be deactivated so you must I mean, you, after you have made a purchase, then you'll be getting that URL. Okay, let me, let me look at this complex number question, okay? Oh, and, the, and for the intensive revision for paper 2, we'll be holding it online, obviously. And I don't think you guys should travel too far or anywhere to go and do a workshop before your paper two and I think we can do it even better online you know because we will have more time to discuss and you'll be less anxious right you after that you can have your dinner do maybe one more um, paper two and then yeah chill and sleep for the night preparing yourself for a good paper two the next day okay let's take a look at 7a 7a we are looking at complex number that follows a geometric progression so the first term second term third term this tells me that this divided by this will be the same as this divided by this because they should share the same common ratio so i will have a z divided by 3 plus 2i this is going to be equal to 4 minus 6i this divided by z yep we are, I'm going to be doing a live stream also, so it will be just like this. Uh, as in like for the, for you who are asking, I assume you are asking about the, uh, the intensive revision that we are going to be having on, on the 5th of November. Yep, it is going to be the same live stream format as this. Okay, let me do this 7a, okay? So if our, my aim is to try to solve for the possible values for z. So for z here, um, if I cross multiply, this is going to be z square. This will be equal to 3 plus 2i multiplied by 4 minus 6i. So z square is going to be equal to expand this, this times this. This is equal to 12 minus 18i plus 8i and this times this is minus 12i square which is going to be plus 12 so i have a z square to be equal to 12 plus 12 24 minus 10i we are supposed to solve for um z and because this question says we are not supposed to be using the calculator so i guess a good way to solve for z is to let z be equal to x plus i y and i will attempt to solve for x and y individually but at the same time, right, I do think that it is also wise for us to do a quick check of uh, what, po what possible answers we will be getting. So, um, okay, I, I, for this that you're asking, right, I'm not very sure, uh, use two simultaneous equation and solve for r. I don't think it is actually possible. Well, I don't really think it is possible because uh, the simultaneous equation is going to be generated from here. Furthermore, right, we are not actually trying to solve for r. But of course, if you manage to solve for r, 3 plus 2i times r is going to give you a z. But I can really solve for z directly. And the good thing is, I don't think we'll have a chance to do it. 
So I will probably stop at 7. Let me show you guys something, okay? You should definitely try to press this into your calculator like this. We have to just do a quick verification for yourself, right? That, um, <clears throat> that okay, if I were to be solving for Z, this is one of the possible answers that I will be getting, right? Because Z is actually just square root of this. In fact, it is plus minus square root of this. But if I can use my calculator, I'll probably just get the answer immediately. Okay, so let me try, okay? So Z is equal to this. So we have uh, X uh, plus I, Y squared. This is equal to 24 minus 10 I. So this is x squared plus i of 2xy, then minus y squared. This is 24 minus 10i. So if I were to regroup the non-i's together, I will have this. And for the i, it will be 2xy. This is 24 minus 10i. <clears throat> if I were to look at the part that has i, the imaginary part, so 2xy, this is equal to minus 10. I'm going to try to make um, y the subject. So y is equal to minus 5 over x. This I will call it equation number 1. We have uh, x squared minus y squared is equal to 24. I'm going to call this equation number 2. And we will definitely try to sub equation number 1 into equation number 2. So we will have x squared minus y squared, which is minus 5 over x squared. This is equal to 24. I'm going to multiply throughout by x squared. This will give me x to the power of 4. Uh, 24 x squared, bring it over to the left hand side. Minus 24 x squared, then minus away 25. This is equal to 0. Mm, we can factorize this with respect to x squared. So it will be x squared plus 1, then x squared minus 25. This is equal to 0. x squared plus 1 is always going to be positive. So you will never give us a 0, which means that x squared minus 25 should be equal to 0. So x is going to be square root of 25. It is going to be plus or minus 5, which is assuring because I see a 5 here. And if x is plus or minus 5, if I were to substitute plus 5 into here, I'll get a minus 1. If I were to substitute a minus 1 into here, I'll get a plus 1. So, plus or minus 5, minus or plus 1. This tells me that Z is going to be plus 5, minus I, or minus 5, then plus I. Okay, which synchronize to this, this is like minus 5 minus I. Okay, so, I have a plus or minus 5 minus I here and here. Okay, my calculator will be my verification. So you'll make it very easy. I mean, you will make it way easier for me to be doing this question just in case I didn't manage to get the answer right with this. At least I can do a little bit of, you know, like reverse engineering during the exam. So this is part one. Let us check out part two. Um... <clears throat> Okay, part two. Oh, part B, sorry. Let's take a look at part B together. <clears throat> so for part B, one. Um, w is this A plus I B. We are supposed to find the possible values of W in terms of A only when I'm given this as a hint. So, and the question, oh, not hint. When I'm given that this is a real number. So let's look at this, w square over w conjugate. Okay, w is this a plus i b. So I have this square divided by w conjugate, which is a minus i b. And I'm going to try to rationalize this because my aim is to try to rewrite this into the form of x plus i y. So rationalizing this, I'll multiply the numerator by a plus i b. And the denominator, also a plus i b. So this is a plus i b to the power of 3 divided by um, a minus i b multiplied by a plus i b. 
So for the denominator, I guess it is straightforward. The denominator will just be a square plus b square. Numerator, let's do a binomial expansion. So it will be a to the power of 3 plus 3 choose 1, which is 3, a to the power of 2, i, b, secondary school is binomial expansion, 3 choose 2 is two, 3 or so, then a of i, b, square, then plus i, b to the power of 3. So in the numerator, we have uh, this uh, and a uh, plus i of 3, a, square, b. i square is minus 1, so minus 3, a, b, square, then i cube is minus i, so minus i b to the power of 3. This divided by a square plus b square. And let's take note that a square plus b square, they are real numbers. Okay, the question says a and b are non-zero real numbers. So this is already a real number. If I were to regroup a cube and uh, this, I'm going to group them together. Minus 3ab square. Then for the i terms, it will be this, 3a square b minus b to the power of 3. And this is going to be divided by a square plus b square. And if I were to just break this up, I have the real portion as this, 3ab square divided by a square plus b square plus i of this. This is 3a square b minus b to the power of 3. This divided by a square plus b square. And the question says that w square over w conjugate is a real number. So if it is a real number, the imaginary portion must be equal to 0. So to continue from here, I am going to be letting w square over w conjugate. Sorry, I'm going to be letting the imaginary part of this be equal to 0. So this means that 3a square b minus b to the power of 3. Mm -hmm. This divided by a square plus b square. This is equal to 0. And uh, if I were to cross multiply, and I will have a 3a square b minus b to the power of 3. This is equal to 0. We can definitely factorize out b, which gives me, me uh, this minus away b square. This is equal to 0. And according to the question, we are supposed to write w in terms of a. So b cannot be equal to 0 because the question did mention to us that um, b is a non-zero real number. So if b cannot be equal to 0, that means 3a square minus b square must be equal to 0. So b square is going to be equal to uh, this 3a square. So b is going to be equal to plus or minus square root of 3a. So w, which is this a plus ib, we know now the two possible values of w. It will be a, I'm supposed to write w in terms of a, so it will be a plus or minus i of square root of 3a. But this will be the two, <coughs> the two possible values of w. Uh, yep, <clears throat> okay, I'm assuming you are referring to B part 1, okay, and this is okay. You can assume that the argument to be positive or negative, uh, positive or negative, this is a real num, yep, that means you can assume that the, okay, well, let me think about it, W square over W conjugate is a real number, yep, you can, so if it is a, if W, if w square over w conjugate is a real number, that means <coughs> that means it must be lying either here or here. So it will be 0 or 2 pi or k pi. It should be 0, it should be either 0 or pi. Um, okay, um, so this is the first part. Let me write down my answer here. So for part one, 
we know that W is going to be equal to uh, this A plus or minus I square root of 3A. And part 2 is very, very simple. We want to find the two possible arguments of W. So for I will have two possible W. W is either A minus I square root of 3A or another possible W will be A plus I square root of 3A. So to find the argument of this, let's try to do a sketch of this on the on an argon diagram. So on an argon diagram, since the question tells me that A is a positive number, so we have a A and we have a negative square root of 3A. And the argument is this. So the argument of W for this case is going to be minus tangent inverse of square root of 3a over a. a a can be cancelled so it will be tangent inverse square root of 3 special angle this is minus pi over 3 and as for this i mean you can definitely still try to sketch this on an argon diagram where it will be a and square root of 3a you can also try to calculate the argument or if you can just see that these are conjugates of each other so if the argument for this is minus pi over 3 that means the argument for this will be just positive pi over 3. Okay. Question number 8a. Let's try this. 8a. We are going to try to find the value of m. m is here. So let me work on the left hand side first. It is an easy integration. So integrating from 0. To 3 of 1 over 9 plus x square dx. In order for me to integrate this, I'm going to be write 9 as 3 square. So this plus x square dx. And I guess we can now make use of the formula that we have in our MF26. So this will give us the tangent inverse formula that will be 1 over 3 then tangent inverse of x over 3 and the lower limit is 2 upper limit is 3 so this is going to be equal to 1 over 3 tangent inverse of 3 over 3 minus away tangent inverse of 0 tangent inverse of 0 is going to be 0 so we have a 1 over 3 tangent inverse 1 tangent inverse 1 is pi over 4 so this is equal to pi over 12, which means that when we try to integrate from 0 to 1 over 2m of 1 over square root of 1 minus m square x square. This should be equal to pi over 12, and we are going to make use of this to solve for m. Um, as for this, I think what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to divide by m outside so that I can introduce uh, m in front because fx is mx, f prime x is going to be equal to m. And we have a formula for this also, which is the sine inverse formula. So we have mx squared dx. This is equal to pi over 12. So I have a 1 over m. Mm, integrating this, we are going to be getting a sine inverse of mx. So from 0 to 1 over 2m, this is equal to pi over 12. So we have a 1 over m. Substituting this in, we have a sine inverse of m times 1 over 2m, sine inverse of half. Minus away sine inverse of 0, which is going to be 0. This is equal to pi over 12. And sine inverse of half, this is uh, going to give us a special angle. And that is pi over 6. So this is equal to pi over 12. This tells me that m over here is equal to 2. Okay, 5 marks. I think it is uh, pretty easy to get 5 marks. Mm. Okay. Okay, 
Next, B. Mm, for B, right, let me show you guys something that is uh, probably a little bit different, but I think it is, it is potentially um, easier probably for some of you. I mean, it, it really depends because I think um, in order for you to be doing this substitution, most people should be using the triangle you know, to do the substitution. The triangle as in like, you know, in order for us to replace cosine 2x, because we are given u is equal to sine 2x. So in order for you to replace cosine 2x, you can either make use of trigonometric identity or the more common strategy is to make use of the triangle. It is a very, very useful triangle. You know, I highlighted this triangle also in the, in the theory outline under integration by substitution. So if I have a right angle triangle sketching this, it will be angle 2x here, sine 2x is going to be u, which we can treat it as if it is u divided by 1. So it is opposite over the hypotenuse. This gives me the adjacent as 1 minus uh, u squared. So from this triangle, we can deduce what we want to replace cosine, u, uh, cosine 2x with, right? Because cosine 2x, looking at this, it is going to be adjacent over the hypotenuse is going to be square root of 1 minus u squared. You can definitely do something that is like this. Okay, but let me show you some another possible strategy, okay? Something that I've shared in my tuition class and I think it can potentially be quite useful occasionally. Okay, it is not a foolproof method, but um, let, let me just show you guys. So we are supposed to do a substitution and my idea is we will substitute only the essential first for this question. And the essentials are going to be here, this, this, and this. Okay, because the idea of integration by substitution is to change your integral such that instead of you integrating it with respect to x, you will now try to integrate it with respect to u. Okay, that is the idea. And so this, this, and this, sorry, not this. <laughs> this, this, and this, dx. With these three parts here in the integration, they must be instantly replaced in order for integration by substitution to take place. Because we want the entire integral to be integrated with respect to u instantly. So <clears throat> let me do a replacement. Let me find a replacement for 0, pi over 4, and dx. So for 0, when um, x is equal to 0, when x is equal to 0, u is going to be equal to sine of 2 times 0, sine 0, this is going to, be go going to be equal to 0. And when x is equal to pi over 4, then u is going to be equal to sine of 2 times of pi over 4, that will be pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. And as for this, u is equal to sine to x. I'm going to differentiate this with respect to u on the left and right hand side. On the left hand side, if I were to differentiate it with respect to u, I get 1. On the right hand side, implicit differentiation, that will be 2 cosine 2x. Then dx du, which means that dx du, this is going to be equal to 1 over 2 cosine 2x. But the thing is, I don't want you to replace cosine 2x yet. Whether it's what I told some of my, I mean, what I told my tuition students about how they can actually do some of the question, specifically those kind of questions where substitution, I mean, substituting and replacing the non-essential expressions are not immediately convenient. My suggestion is to delay the substitution first. You do all the rest of the manipulations and then if it still continue to be inconvenient, then you find some inconvenient ways to continue. But there's a good chance that after you do your manipulation, you'll become way more convenient for substitution. For example, like here, it is going to happen. If I were to be integrating from 0 to pi over 4 of sine to the power of 3 to x, cosine to the power of 3 to x dx. Okay, let's replace the essentials and what they are convenient enough to replace first. So 0, 0 is going to be replaced by 0. Pi over 4 is going to be replaced by 1. 
sine 2x we can very easily replace so I'm going to replace it by u to the power of 3 immediately but cosine 2x is not as easy to replace so I'm going to just hold on the replace we need to replace ultimately okay but let me just hold on for a while for the replacement and dx dx is 1 over 2 cosine 2x du and I can see cancellations that can happen here 1 over 2 I'm going to take it out of the integration notation so we have a u to the power of 3 and we are going to be left with a cosine square 2x du and now it has become convenient because integration from 0 to 1 u to the power of 3 cosine square 2x is just simply 1 minus sine square 2x du and sine 2x is u so now we have a half integration from 0 to 1 of u to the power of 3 1 minus u square du which will get us what we are supposed to show which is 1 over 2 integration from 0 to 1 u to the power of 3 minus u to the power of 5 du Wait, it will, I mean, when, I mean, you can try to consider doing this whenever it is not as convenient to do the substitution and usually it should work. You know why? Because integration by substitution question that comes out, you know, each two math must be set up so it can be solved. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you, no matter how, how much you try to delay the substitution, in the end, the substitutions should still be able to take place. Well, that is why if it is inconvenient, my suggestion is to think about whether you want to delay the substitution first. We just go for those that are essential. I want to repeat again, the essentials will be this part, this part, and this part. With this, you, can, you cannot wait, okay? Unless you, are, you don't plan to initiate the substitution process. If you want to initiate it in the next line, then they must be immediately replaced. <clears throat> How do I decide that it's du dx and not? Okay, somebody asked how do I decide that it is um how do I decide that it is uh do I, how do I decide whether I want to do a du dx or dx du correct? For me I have a default. My default is to always go for dx du. That means my personal I mean it is not necessary. But my personal default is to always go for dx du because the moment when I go for dx du, that means I'll go for the you know because I'm replacing dx, right? So I'll always go for dx du so that the dx can be in the numerator. So it is easier for me to see that this is as if it is going to be this. Okay, so, so my aim, I mean, the way that I decide uh, about this, I mean, the way that I decide on this is so that I want to make dx as the subject. Well, that's why I choose to do a dx du. But it is totally no problem if you were to do a du dx because du dx, I mean, in the end, you can also bring the dx over, then you bring the other term over. You, you can still make dx the subject. Okay? So it's not a very critical thing, but for myself, my personal default, right, is if I'm replacing dx, I'll always do a dx du. If I'm replacing, for example, dy, then I'll do a dy du. So... Anyway, now I've gotten this and the next part, part 2, where the integration will be very, very simple. To integrate this, it is just continuation of this, which is going to be half of u to the power of 4 over 4 minus u to the power of 6 over 6 from 0 to 1. So it is going to be half of 1 quarter minus 1 over 6 then minus 0. This is going to give, give you a 1 over 24. Okay. Uh, okay, I, l l let me just... Um, okay, okay. I, I don't think I should say too much about this, but... Uh, I, you know, I mean, it doesn't really matter, okay, whether you want to do a du dx or dx du. Ultimately, as long as you can make the dx a subject, you know, it will be, it is totally fine. Because you're going to get the same thing anyway, right? So this is question number eight. And, and, and the first question, and then there is NJ with first question argon diagram drawing. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm looking at um I'm looking at this comment. Mm. NJ's oh, as in like NJC's uh paper one, is it? NJC's paper one started with Argon Diagram. Um, I'm, I'm curious how how um your 2020 prelim papers are going to be like. I've definitely not seen any because you guys are writing your solution on the script and submitting it. Okay, let's take a look at question number nine. There's a part in question number nine that I thought it was it is a little bit strange. Let me let me uh talk about it later <laughs> okay part one part one um mm, this is like so easy uh okay let me just write it down here so integration of one over a square minus v square dv this is just going to be uh, making use of the MF26. It will be 1 over 2a ln of modulus of a plus v divided by a minus v plus c. Okay, it is like really a free mark. Is, um, I, I don't think I've ever seen a question that is like this. It is, it is really almost like copying directly from the MF26, just changing the X to V. Then next, um, <clears throat> there's the, this, the motion of the obstacle that is traveling, that is, uh, okay, that's moving in the medium. The velocity is going to be in a relationship with V uh, in this form. And A that is given to us is a positive constant. Okay. And we are supposed to show this. So what this question is trying to hint, us, hint to us is that from here to here, let's try to solve this differential equation. So we have a, a square over 10 of dv dt. This is equal to a square minus v square. Like what I've mentioned before, right? For differential equation, for solving differential equation, you must recognize that there are just two forms for you to solve them. One is if it is a simple differential, the other one is when it is a variable separable kind of differential. So this is a variable separable kind because if it is a simple differential, then dv dt is going to be in terms of just t. But now there's a v, so it should be a variable separable kind. And provided that you are able to re-express it as a function of v multiplied by dv dt is equal to another function in terms of t. And we definitely will be able to do that 1 over a square minus v square, a function in terms of v times dv dt is equal to 1. And I'm going to treat 1 as a function that is in terms of t. Sorry, uh, uh, 1 as the function that t represents. So I have this. I'm going to integrate both left and right hand side with respect to t. On the left hand side, a square over 10 is a constant. I'm going to take out of the integration notation. And we will have a 1 over a square minus v square. And we will be left with a dv is equal to integration of 1 dt. And to integrate this, I guess we are just going to be making use of the previous result. So I have this over 10. Mm, this is going to be 1 over 2a. Then ln of modulus of a plus v divided by a minus v. This is going to be equal to t plus an arbitrary constant. I'm going to go for a. So, um, it is, uh, I guess I can, okay, this I can simplify. So, it is going to be a over 20. a plus v divided by a minus v. This is equal to t plus a. Um, I guess we need to make v the subject and very likely we should be able to solve for this arbitrary constant. And if you were to look at the question, we do have a piece of information that will allow me to do that, which is this. Where t seconds after release from rest. From rest means that when t is equal to zero, 
v is equal to 0. We'll be using it. We'll probably be using this to solve for the arbitrary constant. Um, let, me, let me do a little bit more of um, manipulation first. Okay, so we have this divided by a minus v. This is equal to 20t over a plus 20a over a. Very nice. Because 20t over a is what that is happening here. And if I were to remove this lawn, bring it over to the, the other side, we have a modulus of a plus v divided by a minus v is e to the power of this, which I can also rewrite it as e to the power of 20a over a times e to the power of 20t over a. And then removing the modulus, a minus v, this is plus or minus e to the power of 20a over a, e to the power of 20t over a, which is equal to b, e to the power of 20t over a, where b here represents plus or minus e to the power of 20a over a. Um, I guess here is a good time for us to be substituting t is equal to 0, v is equal to 0 to solve for b. So let me do that. When t is equal to 0, according to the question, v is equal to 0. So we have uh, a plus 0 divided by a minus 0. If I were to replace v by 0, is equal to b, e to the power of t is equal to 0. So e to the power of 0, this is 1. This tells me that b is going to be equal to a divided by a, which is 1. Therefore, I know a plus v divided by a minus v. This is e to the power of 20t over a. And we are going to try to make v the subject. So let me cross multiply a plus v. This is equal to uh, a e to the power of 20t over a minus v e to the power of 20t over a and then i'll bring the v over to the left hand side so v e to the power of 20t over a plus v this is equal to um, a e to the power of 20t over a minus a so now if I were to factorize out v, then bring this over to the other side and factorizing out a also, we have a, a of e to the power of 20t over a minus 1 divided by e to the power of 20t over a plus 1. Okay, which is what the question wants us to show. Can we find a first easier to solve? Mm. Okay. <coughs> I think um, for me, right, I, I, I have not tried myself in whether I should, I should try to find A first, but then, then whether it is going to be easier to solve. Uh, maybe it will, be, it will turn out to be, I'm not sure, you can give it a try, Claire, but in general, right, I will do the substitution after I remove the modulus. Because if I don't remove the modulus, then there will be a plus there will be potentially this plus or minus which means that down the road i i will need to find a way to remove the plus or minus depending on the context of the question but if i can remove the plus or minus and like, like integrating it into b then the calculation itself will decide for me whether it is going to be a plus or a minus so i mean you can try but uh, my suggestion is in the exam, right? I mean, when you are practicing, definitely you should just try it, okay? But in the exam, my suggestion is uh, try to go, I mean, try to continue to simplify until re you sort of like remove the modulus or at least not having the modulus being something that uh, you got to make a decision, like for example, plus or minus, you know, so if you can be just going into B, then solving for B, you know, all the decision can be made numerically, it will probably be easier and better. Hmm. So if you have tried and and it is easier, it will, not it will. 
uh, modulus of a over a is equal to, yep, modulus of a over a is, yep, then it's okay. But if you try and you, it turns out to be easy enough, right, then just go ahead. The, uh, the worst is uh, if you happen to not have a nice, I mean, if, you, if it is not as easy for you to remove the modulus, then you probably got to make some decision based on the context. Uh, I'm not sure actually, because I've not seen I I've not seen the any of the 2020 paper this year, but so far based on the 2019 paper that we have done here, uh, I do think A ACJC is the hardest you know, uh, the hardest that we did was ACJC. Then after that it was the A ASRJC that we did. Okay, let me continue. So we have V to be equal to this. I mean, <clears throat> when I look at part B, right, I'm, I'm, I find that it is a little bit strange. Because when I look at um, RI's solution to part B, um, I, when I was looking at RI's solution to part B and the teacher's comment to part B, it really makes me wonder about um, you know, how, how this question was... Uh, originally intended to be okay let, let's take a look at this question first okay this question says that the rate of change of the displacement is going to be the velocity the velocity is this so if v is equal to this what this question says is that v is also dx dt so dx dt is a then um e to the power of 20 t over a then minus 1 divided by e to the power of 20t over a plus 1. Okay, and the question says that a is equal to 2. So we have this as a 2, then e to the power of 10t minus 1 divided by e to the power of 10t plus 1. Okay, I mean, writing down this, I don't think we are going to get any marks at all. So we are supposed to make use of this we to find the value of x when t is equal to 1. Okay, find the value of x when t is equal to 1. If you can remember what you have done in your kinematics in your secondary school, um, and I'm not even sure whether your secondary school do it this way, which I'm going to try to write down next, lah, okay? Um, and just in case you have never done it this way in your secondary school's kinematics or if you have forgotten about kinematics, I actually don't suggest that you try this. The risk is a little bit high because um, I'm not very sure so, but to me this is a bit more physics. It, it's a bit too physics. You know, so I'm not sure whether um, if you have never done enough physics, you will be able to get this. So let me just write it down, okay? But I'm not going to do much explanation to it. Uh, if you know it either through physics or if your secondary school actually uses strategy, then fine. If not, I'm going to show you another way, which is you can actually integrate uh, both the left and right hand side with respect to t, and then you do a definite integral. But that means on the left hand side, you integrate x, I mean, you integrate with respect to t and from 0 to x of dx, sorry, uh, uh, of dx is equal to, on the right hand side, you integrate from 0 to 1. Okay, because it is all the way until 1, and you're supposed to get x. So it is going to be this, then 2, then this is going to be e to the power of 10t minus 1 divided by e to the power of 10t plus 1, then the t. And you can just press this into your calculator. On the left hand side, it's just going to be x. It's just going to be x, then after that, from 0 to x, on the right hand side, you just press it into your GC. Then on the left hand side, you're just going to get your X because the other one is zero. And this is going to give you a 1.723, which is actually the answer for this. So when I was reading the, the RI solution, right, they gave this as the solution. And I was reading the, the teacher's comments um, about this question. So one thing that they have pointed out is that um, a lot of students try to do this, I mean, try to continue with this manually. Okay, that means doing the manual integration, which is what I'm going to try to do with you now, okay? That means I want to do the manual integration with you now as a 
even if it is a practice, I think it is a good chance for us to try because um this integral is not the is not exactly an easy enough one to integrate manually, but I have seen this coming out quite a couple of times in prelims before. So I don't mind trying this now, you know, integrating this manually. So so that, that was uh, RI's comment. You know, a lot, of, a lot of students try to do this manually. Uh, but when I think about it, right, I was just wondering, okay, if you don't plan to, I mean, if you, if, if the examiner, if the setter has planned for this question to be done in this way, and, and whatever that is written so far, right, I think it is just going to be worth two marks, you know, answer is definitely going to be one mark and writing down an integral, pressing the calculator and this integral is not like it's going to be very, very difficult. So maximum I'll give is just one mark. So the maximum possible for a question that is like this is probably two marks. So one reason why students will actually do it manually, it may not actually be because students didn't know that they have to do this, it's because the marks that is allocated is very confusing because it gave three marks, more than what that seems to be, you know, the marks allocation for something that is so short. But that's why I, when I was thinking about this, I was just wondering, you know, did it, was this the, or, the original plan of the examiner that students should be pressing the calculator? You know, that's why, I mean, and, and, or, or was the original plan for this to be done manually? That's why it was allocated three marks. I mean, I don't know, but um, I'm going to just try to solve this manually with, together with you, okay? Let's try to do a quick practice together. So in the first part, in order for us to integrate, we make use of, uh, I mean, we see, we see this as a variable separable. And now dx dt is in terms of just t. So this is a simple differential. We can do a definite integral. So on the left hand side, it will become x. On the right hand side, it is just going to be 2 integration from, um, integ sorry, no, no definite integral. So, sorry, no definite integral. So it is an indefinite integral. So integrating e to the power of 10 t minus 1 divided by e to the power of 10 t plus 1 dt. And I asked myself like very, very honestly, right? I would have done this manually because of the three marks. Especially if it comes out in the A level, I would definitely not try to just press it into a calculator directly. Okay, let's try to integrate this. Um, <clears throat> There are some common strategies that students tend to use to integrate this. So I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to do something that is like this. Okay, let's say plus one minus two divided by e to the power of 10 t plus one. And I'll see this as one expression by itself. Or you can also try to do a long division with respect to e to the power of 10 t. You'll get a two integration of this divided by this is one, then minus two over e to the power of 10t plus 1 dt. So we will be integrating 1. So let me write it down. 2 integration of 1 dt minus away um, 4. Then integration of this 1 over e to the power of 10t plus 1 dt. And to integrate this, I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by e to the power of minus 10t, which will then give me this. Let me show you. So minus 4. I'll multiply the numerator by e to the power of minus 10t. And multiplying the denominator by e to the power of minus 10t, this will become 1. Then plus this, this will become e to the power of minus 10t dt. And I'm going to treat ft as the entire denominator here. So this is 1 plus e to the power of minus 10t, which means that f prime t, this is going to be minus 10 e to the power of minus 10t. So f prime t is minus 10 multiplied by this. So I need a minus 10 here, so let me divide by a minus 10 outside. So I have a 2 integration of 1 dt minus 4 minus 1 over 10. So that I can have a minus 10 e to the power of minus 10 t here in front. And I have a 1 over, this is the f prime, and uh, this is the f, and this is the f prime. So 1 plus e to the power of minus 10 t dt. 
So we have a uh, 2, integrating this is going to be t. And this times this is going to be plus 2 over 5. And integrating this is going to be ln modulus of the denominator. And since the denominator is always positive, I'm going to just replace the modulus with a normal curve bracket then plus c, the arbitrary constant. Um, this, right, actually it is more common to write it as this. Okay, if in general, if you are integrating, in general, if you are integrating uh, 1 dx, actually very seldom people write it in this form. Most people, if you were to go and read textbooks, right, most of the people will just write it in this form. So it is not uncommon for us to be seeing this. And this kind of notation, if you are not familiar with, right, uh, it is good for us to take note of just in case during the A-level they use notation that is like this instead of this. We have another notation that maybe some of you may find weird. This is not as often used in H2 math. Is, uh, if you are integrating this, it is actually possible to rewrite it as this. <laughs> this is like very weird to me. Because I seldom write it in this way because I know it is not like dx divided by this, but you do see some international textbook that go for this. Okay, so I have this, and I'm going to make use of the fact that the body is released. Uh, x is the value. X is the value when the body is being released. So. I know when t is equal to 0, x is equal to 0. So if I were to substitute it in 0, it's going to be equal to 2 times 0 plus 2 over 5 ln 1 plus e to the power of 0 is 1 plus c. This tells me that c is equal to minus 2 over 5 ln 2. So I know the full equation for x in terms of t, that is uh, 2t plus 2 over 5 ln 1 plus e to the power of minus 10t, then minus 2 over 5 ln 2. And we are supposed to find the value of x when t is equal to 1. So when t is equal to 1, x will be 2 of 1. 2 over 5 ln of 1 plus e to the power of minus 10 minus 2 over 5 ln 2. Pressing this into the calculator, I get 1.72323 decimal places, which is actually exactly the same as this. But like what I was saying, I feel that the marks allocation has been very, very confusing for this particular question. Because if calculator is actually allowed, uh, the amount of marks that I personally will will go for is 2, not 3. Okay, so 3 will usually prompt students to do a little bit more, but this seems to be a little bit too much, <laughs> so, so I'm not sure. But I think this set of solution here is probably going to be about 4 marks. But anyway, it is a, it is a good practice. Okay, and yes, A is equal to 2 is given to us by the question. Okay, A is equal to 2. Okay, let's continue. Let's take a look at question number 10. Yep, definitely, you know, you can just press this entire thing into your GC. If someone is asking, can you use your GC? Because that is uh, the original intent. I mean, that is the intention of RI if you were to look at their solution, is to just directly press this into your GC because X is equal to this when T is equal to 1. Okay, so you can just integrate it from 0 to 1. But just in case some of you don't really understand why you can integrate from 0 to 1 to get a value of x when t is equal to 1, I will suggest that you stick to this. Okay, because I, I feel that to be able to do this is a bit too kinematics, it's a little bit too physics. So if you have not revisited um, your kinematics or if you are not uh, like continuously be in touch with physics, you may have a bit of trouble thinking about why 0 to 1. But Mathematically, it can be proven also if you were to just do this entire thing and then consolidating them, uh, you will be able to see that you are actually doing this just, just that you are doing it twice. Okay, 
Anyway, um, I'm not going to talk too much about this part. Right? I think practicing this right is actually going to be a it's going to be a good ex exercise for us. You know, before your prelim. Let's move on to question number ten. Question number 10 is a graphing question. Question number 10. Yep, yeah. So question number 10, we have curve C1 and we have curve C2. We want to verify one mark. We want to verify that minus 3, minus 4. Mm, okay, somebody asked a... Uh, question that I think is a bit uh, strange. What um, I'm curious, why would you be asking about this radian mode? Because we are not dealing with any angles in question number 9. So it doesn't really... Question number 9... Yeah, it doesn't really matter whether you are using degree or radians. But in general, right, if you are doing calculus, if the question didn't mention anything, your default should be in radians. It is the same for O levels and A levels. Okay, for all calculus question, uh, I mean they can specify that you are supposed to do it in degree, but if not, default it is always going to be in radians. Okay, so part one is a verification question. Um yeah, maybe we'll be ending quite early today. I'm not very sure because last week, uh, Tuesday, I thought we'll be ending like before 9.30 or maybe we can even do question number 8. But in the end, we ended at 10. Oh, yeah, but that was because we went on to explain some of the complex numbers and uh, and the magic triangle and the vectors stuff. But uh, if if not, we will probably be ending a little bit earlier. I, don't, I, I find 11 very okay. You know, it is 10 that is a little bit tedious. Uh, 10 is unexpectedly tedious. Which I suddenly can recall, you know, last year my student did, to, did tell me before, right, that uh, towards the last few questions, they realized that it was very, very tedious. That, that was why on Tuesday I was saying for this RI paper, it may feel pretty okay uh, doing it as a revision. You know, but doing an exam, trying to compress this, the solution into a three hour, into the three hour for this paper, right, it can actually be quite challenging. So you must, meet, uh, you must uh, make sure that you you do the first few parts very, very fast. The first few questions very, very fast. So um, to verify that it lies on C1. So for, let me write it down. For the curve C1, to verify that it, this point minus 3, minus 4 lies here, I am going to sub minus 3 into X and minus 4 into Y. And this gives me a 25. Therefore, I know minus 3 minus 4 lies on C1. And for C2, I am going to sub minus 3 into the right hand side. This gives me a minus 3 plus 3 plus 24 over minus 3 minus 3. This gives me a minus 4. Therefore, again, minus 3 minus 4 lies on C2. Okay, a very easy to get mark. Part 2. By the way, um, for... For well, question number 10's integration, right, I I mean, assuming that you are referring to the second part, the dx dt's integration, my suggestion is for you to um, like practice and memorize this manipulation. You know, like doing a long division to make it into a constant, then constant divided by something, then plus e to the power of, you know, then multiply top and bottom by e to the power of minus. You know, I'll suggest that you you memorize this and try to see whether there's a chance for you to apply this a few more times. Because if you don't memorize this, right, you know, in the exam, 
I don't think it is that easy for you to come up with a strategy for this. But of course, it is possible. It's just that you're going to waste some time thinking about a possible strategy. Because there are a few where you can either do the one that I just did. Or I think it, it may also be possible if you were to factorize a half of the power. You know, e to the power of uh, then half of the half of the power. You know, I think that may work also. I'm not... Okay, I'm not very sure I'm going to try it. But sometimes doing that, it will work also. Okay, anyway, let me try to sketch this graph. Um, let us have, a, have an idea of C1 and C2 first. Okay, C1 is definitely going to be a circle, right? But this is the one that we want to make sure that we take care of. If it is a circle, you know, if it is just simply a full circle, it's going to be a circle with the center at the origin and the radius is going to be 5. If it is just going to be a full circle, but because the question says that it is less than or equal to zero, why is less than or equal to, why is less than or equal to zero? So we are talking about the part of the circle that is only below the x-axis, and it can be equal to zero. The y coordinates can be equal to zero. So let's not forget the two solid dots at the two ends. As for this, this has two asymptotes: an oblique asymptote and a vertical asymptote. Let's sketch C2 first. So for C2, let me do a quick sketch here. So Y axis, um, the X axis. Like what I've suggested to you guys before, right? Let's, let's try to sketch in the asymptotes first. Okay, then we sketch in the rest. So we have an oblique asymptote. This is y is equal to x plus 3. We have a vertical asymptote. The vertical asymptote is x is equal to 3. It is a value of x that causes y to become undefined. If I were to press this into the calculator, by default on your zoom standard screen, you will not see this part of the graph. But because of our experience, we know that there is probably going to be something here. So please make sure that you do a bit of zooming. And because the Y coordinate that is at this point, right? The X coordinate is this, but the Y coordinate is 15.8. In your zoom standard screen, the maximum it goes is by default, it is 10. That's why this part will be missing. But because you're expecting, I mean, because you know that there are going to be these two asymptotes already. So you should be expecting something here. Okay, so please remember to do a zoom out to try to see this part of the graph, okay? Then, um, for this other part, we have this. Something like this. Pretending towards the asymptote. <clears throat> you will be interacting with the circle because this point here, when x is equal to 0, this point here is going to be 0 and minus 5. 0 minus 5, which is actually this point. And here is minus 3. So minus 5 is going to be a little bit more towards the left. So maybe somewhere here is where my circle is going to start. And you will pass through here, minimum point, and you will continue ending here. Okay, this point here will be 5, 0. This point here will be minus 5, 0 and um, the point minus 3 minus 4 lies on both C1 and C2 and it should be this point right minus 3 minus 4 the maximum possible point here if I were to press my calculator is minus 1.90 and minus 3.80 mm, okay so this is the graph of x squared plus y squared is equal to 25 where y is supposed to be less than or equal to 0. As for this other graph, this other graph is the graph of y is equal to x plus 3 plus 24 over x minus 3. Let me see, have I put in enough details? Okay, I've gotten all the details. So this is part 2 for the two graphs. Um, for, if I show right, 
um, I'm not sure how to like very clearly distinguish between verify and show, but uh, it is almost like show. So a, a verification that is of this kind of nature, I can just simply substitute the numbers in to verify you know, that it is, it is lying on the line. I'm lying on the two curves. And my, <clears throat> the dots, right? It doesn't really matter whether you are doing a graph that is like this or whether you are doing a parametric. With the dots that are at the, the dots are supposed to be there every time when you have an endpoint. So they can be solid dot or, or a hollow dot. Okay, so these two points, sorry, these two points here, right, they are endpoints. Okay, that is why they must come with a solid or hollow dots. And you should indicate the coordinates of all the endpoints. Okay, and again, I want to repeat, it is, this is regardless of whether you are doing it for a parametric or whether you are doing it for a Cartesian. As long as a graph has an endpoint, you must indicate. Because, like for example here, 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 this point. These four ends here, they are no, I mean they are not ending. In fact, they are continuing. So without indicating anything at these four positions, you know, the, the, the interpretation, right, is that the graph is supposed to continue. The graph is supposed to continue. So if you don't want to indicate anything here, that means the, the, the interpretation should be the graph is going to continue. The graph is going to continue. Okay, that is why as long as there's an end point, you must place in either a solid dot or, an, or a hollow dot. Okay? Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, I've already drawn a graph so that I can I can do some uh, shading for part three and part four. So it is the same graph. Give me a second. Oops, what's happening? Where is my graph? Okay, here. Okay, this is the same graph. So now we are working on this region R. According to the question, region R is the region that is bounded by C1 and C2. Okay, region R is bounded by C1 and C2. This is our curve C1 and this is our curve C2. So this is the only region that is bounded by the two curves. And we are supposed to find the volume when this region is being rotated about the x-axis. Okay, this region is going to be rotated about the x-axis. So we need the x-coordinate of this point, which we know it is minus 3. We need the x-coordinate of this point, we know it is going to be 2. Uh, it's going to be equal to 0. So in order for us to find the volume, and, and the worst about this question is that we are supposed to find the volume, like uh, the exact volume, so we need to do the manual integration. So for the integration wise, for volume, uh, for volume in this part 2 of the question, we will, we will take this graph, this curve here, and we will rotate. It is part of the graph, and we will rotate. Actually, we, I shouldn't just immediately write the volume first. We need, we need this part of the graph. Where this part of the graph is when y is supposed to be less than or equal to 0. So, I have a x squared plus y squared. This is equal to 25. Where y is supposed to be less than or equal to 0. So, y squared is equal to 25 minus x squared. This tells me that y is supposed to be plus or minus square root of 25 minus x squared. But I'm going to go for minus square root of 25 minus x squared because y is supposed to be less than or equal to 0. So this part of the graph is supposed to be y is equal to minus square root of 25 minus x squared. 
and we are going to take this portion of the graph you know, that means we are looking at this entire region here and we will rotate to find the first volume so it will be pi integrating from minus 3 to 0 of minus square root of 25 minus x square square dx so is this entire region rotate then our minus away this region here this bottom region here now minus away this region here rotate and when I rotate this region we are making use of this graph so it is going to be pi integrating from minus 3 to 0 of this graph x plus 3 plus 24 over x minus 3 square dx okay so let me just very quickly repeat this this first volume here is generated by taking this part of the graph integrating it from minus 3 all the way until 0 so I'm taking this region here rotate minus away taking this part of the graph from minus 3 all the way until 0 so I'll minus away this region here rotated about the x-axis which will give me then the volume of this region being rotated about the x-axis so for this here um, we are supposed to integrate this like manually so uh, it's more tedious than I've expected so I think uh, probably easier presentation is to try to work this out separately so let me just integrate this first minus 3 all the way until 0 of this minus square root of 25 minus x square square dx and this is integrating from minus 3 to 0 of 25 minus x square dx it will be 25x minus x to the power of 3 divided by 3 from minus 3 to 0 so it will be 0 minus away 25 times minus 3 minus minus 3 cubed divided by 3 and this will give you a 66 and then let's integrate this this is very very tedious this to 0 of x plus 3 plus 24 over x minus 3 square dx and in order for you to square this my suggestion is to treat this as two terms so i'm going to treat this as one term treating this as another term so squaring this applying your a plus b square applying your a plus b square it is going to be a square plus 2ab, 2 times this is 48, of x plus 3 divided by x minus 3. Then plus b squared, 24 squared, 24 squared is uh, 5, 7, 6, divided by x minus 3 squared, dx. So it will be from minus 3 to 0. This can be integrated. I'm going to leave it as it is. As for this, well, this cannot be integrated as itself. We're going to do a long division. Doing a long division to this is 1 plus 6 over x minus 3. Then this is a form that can be integrated. As for this, this is no problem with the integration. I'm going to just rewrite this to be the power of minus 2 okay now it is ready to be integrated so this is going to be x plus 3 to the power of 3 divided by 3 then plus 48 of this is x plus 6 ln modulus of x minus 3 plus 5 7 6 x minus 3 to the power of minus 1 divided by minus 1 from minus 3 to 0 um, 
please be a bit patient with me. Let me let me do the substitution, okay? Because there's a minor, not not very very difficult, but there's a minor detail that I want to talk about. So let me just re-express this properly. X plus three to the power of three plus um forty eight x plus forty eight times six that gives me a two eight eight. Then ln modulus of x minus three. Then minus away this is five seven six divided by x minus three. From minus three to zero. Okay, and, and can you watch out about this together with me? Um, it occurred in the A levels in one of the years. Sorry, I can't remember which year, but. <clears throat> What that's going to happen now, right? Okay, I'm going to substitute 0 in. So we'll have a 0. So 0 plus 3 is 3 to the power of 3. Plus this is going to be 0. Plus 288 ln of modulus of 0 minus 3 is ln of minus 3. This is the detail that I want to discuss. I mean, that I want to bring up to you guys. Because um, we, are always, we have always been taught about... Um, when we, when we carry out a process of integration, we must put this modulus. And the reason why you need to put in the modulus is specifically for definite integral. But very seldom we will, I mean, even despite the fact that we are putting a modulus, you know, will we get a chance to see something that is negative appearing within. Okay, so now we see this, you are supposed to do a long positive tree right? because of the modulus. Okay, so this modulus is really helpful, okay? If you don't have the modulus, that means it will be ln normal bracket minus 3 is going to be undefined. It's going to happen also when you substitute minus 3 in. So it will be 1 over 3. Oh, minus 3 in this is going to be 0. Then plus 48 of minus 3 plus 288 ln of minus 3 minus 3 is minus 6. Again, we need the modulus in order for... We need the modulus in order for it to be defined. Okay, so we will treat this as if we will need to we will be treating this as if it is a lawn 6. We will be treating this as if it is a lawn 3. Okay, and if you were to simplify this, you will be getting a 249 minus 288 lawn 2. So the volume is going to be pi of this integral, pi of 66, minus away pi of this integral, 249 minus 288 ln 2. And your answer will be 288 ln 2 minus 183 pi. Which is, uh, <coughs> it's very, very tedious, but in the recent A levels, right, there are uh, actually a few questions that are just pure tediousness, like really just pure tediousness. I think two years ago, if you were to check out the the uh, discrete random variable question, if I remember correctly, it is extremely tedious. So do watch out for this kind of question appearing in this year's A level. Also, we will never know. It is not about concept. It is not about theories anymore. It is really about pure tedious algebra that you are supposed to be executing in the exam. Okay. A slim slanted donut. Oh, as in like this becomes a slim slanted donut. That's what Claire you are saying, right? Uh, okay, let's take a look at the next part of the question. Let me erase this first. The next part of the question is actually pretty okay. <clears throat> you know, I have mentioned about this in the on the Achievers TV uh, under integration area and volume, you know, how we can do something that is like part four. Let me quote uh, part the first part of part four here. We are looking at <clears throat> we are looking at the region that is bounded by C1. Okay, let me make this a little bit bigger. We are bounded by the region, sorry, 
we are bounded by C1, C1, the x-axis, and the vertical asymptote of C2. Okay, and the region that we are looking at is when x is bigger than 3. So the region that we are looking at now is this region here. Okay, this is region S. And the first thing that we are supposed to do is to look at this curve C1, and we are going to translate it by 3 units in the negative x direction. So translating this by 3 units in the negative x direction, it is replacing all the x by x plus 3. So replacing x by x plus 3, we will have uh, x plus 3 square plus y square. This is equal to 25, where y is still supposed to be less than or equal to 0. Please remember to write this in, okay? Because this is part of your description of the curve C1. Okay, by doing a translation, it doesn't mean that suddenly the positive portion of the y will appear. So this is still essential, or else I don't think you're going to be getting the marks. Yeah, and the max, I think it is going to be just one mark. Okay, so if you have missed this out, probably you are going to lose the full one mark. Okay, so replacing all the x by x plus 3, I've gotten this. And what the next part of the question is asking for is for this region S to be rotated by 2 pi about the about the vertical asymptote of C2. So this region here is going to be rotated about x is equal to 3. And we don't have any formula that can help us to find the volume that is generated when a region is rotated about any axis that are not the x and y axis. The formula only allow us to rotate regions about the x or the y axis. Okay, only the x or the y axis. So just like what I've mentioned on the Achievers TV theory outline under volume, whenever this happens, you do a transformation, which was what the first part of the question is asking you to do. You, you carry out a transformation and you try to translate this entire graph by 3 units, 3 units, by 3 units in the negative x direction, which means that the new graph that you are going to be looking at now is going to be a graph that looks like this. Here is going to be our y-axis. The entire semicircle, right, is going to be rotated. It's not rotated, it's going to be translated by three units. So the center from 0, 0 will become negative 3, 0. And this region S is this region here, right, because it is going to be translated by three units. So the vertical asymptote will now coincide with the y-axis and now we have a region that we can rotate about a y, an x or a y-axis and we will have a formula for this. Uh, <clears throat> so we need to make x the subject in order for us to be rotating this with respect to the y-axis. Making x the subject, let's see, we have uh, x squared plus y squared is equal to 25, where y is supposed to be less than or equal to 0. So x square is going to be equal to, oh sorry, no, not this. We are looking at a new curve now. So it is x plus 3 square plus y square. This is equal to 25, where y is supposed to be less than or equal to 0. So x plus 3 square, this is going to be equal to 25 minus y square x is going to be equal to minus 3 plus or minus square root of 25 minus y square. But because we are looking at x to be strictly bigger than 3, and the question also mentioned this. So plus or minus, we will choose plus. So the x can be bigger than 3. So this is minus 3 plus square root of 25 minus y square. Okay, anyway, we are looking at this part of the region. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so um, we have this part of the graph. Okay, and this part of the graph is defined by x is equal to minus 3 plus square root of 25 minus y squared. So now the volume that is going to be generated is going to be pi integrating from this value all the way until zero. We need to find this value. Oops, let me find it first. Okay, I've forgotten. 
<coughs> we need to find this value. This is very, very easy to find. We just simply need to let uh, x be equal to 0, right? So letting x be equal to 0, it will be 3 square plus y square is equal to 25. So y square is going to be equal to uh, 16 y is going to be equal to plus or minus 4 but because y is less than 0 so I'm going to choose a minus 4 so I know the y coordinate here is minus 4 so for volume wise we'll be integrating from minus 4 all the way until 0 of this curve which we know is minus 3 plus square root of 25 minus y square square dy and since now there's no restriction by the question we will just press this into the calculator and this is 28.6 okay please remember to break up the graph into two parts so <clears throat> this x when you make it the subject you have two parts um <clears throat> actually i mentioned i i say it wrongly i shouldn't i don't have to really consider about uh I don't really have to consider about this x is x is bigger than three, because this is more for the original, the original curve. It is more for this curve. So for this curve here, right, we are looking at x to be. I mean, we are looking at this part of the graph, because this is the part of the graph that binds this region to the y-axis, right? And this part of the graph is definitely bigger than minus three because it's on the right hand side of minus three. That's why we choose a minus three plus. To the left hand side of minus 3, this part of the graph, if you actually want to code the equation, this will be minus 3 minus square root of 25 minus y square. Okay? And then let's look at the last question, you know, the vectors question, which is actually not too bad. I think it is an okay question. The <coughs> The diagram looks very intimidating. You know, when I was uh, just browsing through this paper, I was like, goodness, you know, what, what, is, uh, what exactly is happening in the last part of the question? Why is suddenly, why suddenly there's this, this, this weird diagram? Then I realized it is about B's and N's, which I like. You know why I like? Because uh, when I was in a university, my final year project was about N's. <laughs> it was, uh, I, was trying to, I was trying to do a research on the way N's move. And then I was trying to I was trying to implement it on some robots, so 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 when I see these ends, you know, it just reminds me of something that I research about in a university. Okay, <clears throat> um, part A. The path integration, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to leave it to you guys to read this, okay? So, <clears throat> mm, there's this homebound vector, and this vector is A, O. The honeybee is going to start from the origin. So, the diagram, I mean, let me draw a quick diagram, okay? So, from the origin, let's say here is the origin. From the origin, the honeybee is going to travel six units so six units let's say this the honeybee will travel six units and six units in the direction of the vector minus one two minus two <clears throat> really the you think the the setter is inspired by my final year project. <laughs> I mean, I, I did that when I was in a university. So I doubt, uh, I doubt RI will have the copy of my research. Then after this, the honeybee will travel again to the point A. And the honeybee will travel now 15 units. We have the direction. That it's going to be traveling, it's going to be parallel. I mean, it's going to be in the direction of 3, 0, minus 4. Okay, 
So what we are supposed to do is to find this vector a o. So vector a o is the same as negative of vector o a, correct? So vector o a is going to be this vector plus this vector. This vector has a magnitude of 6 and it is in the same direction as minus 1, 2, minus 2. Okay, it is in the same direction as minus 1, 2, minus 2. Um, this minus 1, 2, minus 2 has its own magnitude. So what I'm going to do is to look at this from the perspective of its unit vector, which has a magnitude of just 1, but you will bear the same direction as minus 1, 2, minus 2. So if I were to look at this from the from the perspective of unit vector, I'll just need to take 6 multiplied by its unit vector, I will be able to get this vector. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take 6 multiplied by the unit vector of this, which is minus 1, 2, minus 2, divided by modulus of minus 1, 2, minus 2. I'll do likewise for this vector. To get this vector, I'm going to take 15, multiply by the unit vector that is in this direction. So it will be 3, 0, minus 4. This is divided by modulus of 3, 0, minus 4. Um, <clears throat> we will have a... We will have a... What is it? 6 divided by 3. Uh, 2 to 3, yep. So it will be 6 divided by 3 is 2. 2 of minus 1, 2, minus 2, plus this is going to be 5, so I will have a 3. 15 divided by 5, 3, 3, 0, minus 4. This will give me a vector minus 7, 4, 16. Sorry, minus 7, minus 4, 16. And this is minus 7i, minus 4j, then plus 16k, okay, which is what the question want me to show. And hence, find the distance the honeybee is away from its hive. So the distance, oh, this is like so easy. The distance is going to be just modulus of AO. This is going to be square root of 7 square, 4 square, 16 square. So this is square root of 3, 2, 1. Okay, 3 marks. Um, <clears throat> next. Oh, um, part 2, right? I think part 2 is just trying to make use of a bit of common sense here and there. So I don't think I can use any math to talk about part 2. So let me just write down the, the solution from what I read in RI's solution, okay? So RI wrote this. Um, the home... The homebound vector may be blocked. The homebound vector may be blocked you know, along its path, so the honeybee may not like keep moving in this in the direction that intent that it has intended to, so it may have to change its course and blah blah blah. But that's why <clears throat> that's why uh this path integration strategy right it may fail. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I think part A is like really very very easy. We, um, and I and I do appreciate that Ri set this question number eleven A as an easier question because that will give students a chance to. Um, to get used to reading and reacting to questions that is uh, like this, like something that is uh, related to the real life. Because, I mean, you just imagine, okay, if you set a question that is already related, I mean, that is already trying to talk about a scenario that most people are not familiar with, and, and the aim of, the, of this kind of question, right, is so that you can, be, you can react in real time to this kind of unfamiliar scenario. But then you make the calculation and the math part very, very difficult. You know, and I think it missed the point. You know, it missed the point that the key is not about the math. You know, not just about the math. The key is about 
looking at a scenario that you may not be so familiar with, understanding that scenario, and then applying math to calculate that scenario. Okay, so, so I think the essence of this kind of question is very nicely brought up by this question number 11. We're setting something that is not exactly that difficult. So it gives us the, the space to, to really think about, you know, like how this B is traveling and so on. Um, <clears throat> then part three, we have this row of flowers that is going to be along this line. We want to find um, the point, which is the shortest distance from A, which is what we have found from A to the flower. So it is asking for, in other words, it is asking for the foot of the perpendicular. We need the equation of this line in the vector form. So for part three, let me rewrite the equation of the line in vector form first. Then we find the foot of the perpendicular. I'm going to let x minus three over five be equal to, let's say, mu. I'm using mu because uh, in part B, the question has already used lambda. Okay, so I'm using mu. This tells me that x is equal to 3 plus 5 mu and y plus 2. I'm going to let it be mu. This tells me that y is equal to minus 2 plus mu. And as for z, z is already 2. So rewriting this in terms of r as x, y, z, I see this as 3 plus 5 mu minus 2 plus mu and 2. So um, I'm going to name this line L, okay? So L is like R is equal to breaking this up 3 minus 2, 2 plus mu of 5, 1, 0. And according to the question, we are supposed to look at point A. This is AO. So point A should have a coordinate of negative of this. So you should have a coordinate of 7, 4 and minus 16. So we are trying to find the foot of the perpendicular from A to the line L. I'm going to name the foot of perpendicular, let's say F. So we are going to try to find this. And since F is a point that lies on L, we know that OF can assume this format. So 3 plus 5 mu then minus 2 plus mu and 2. Okay, OF is this. We can also find AF, which is a vector that is perpendicular to the line L. AF is OF minus OA. So 3 plus 5 mu minus 2 plus mu and 2. This minus OA, which is 7, 4 minus 16. And AF is going to be equal to minus 4 plus 5 mu minus 6 plus mu and 18 plus mu AF. And because AF is perpendicular to the line L, and the line L is parallel to the vector 5, 1, 0. So I know AF dot 5, 1, 0. This should be equal to 0. So minus 4 plus 5 mu, minus 6 plus mu, 18 plus mu. This dot 5, 1, 0. This should be equal to 0. And we will be getting a minus 20 plus 25 mu, minus 6 plus mu. This is equal to 0. This will help me to solve for mu. Mu is equal to 1. And we will now be able to find the position vector <coughs> of the nearest point, And that will be substituting 1 back into here. 3 plus 5 minus 2 plus 1, 2. So the position vector is uh, 8 minus 1, 2. The APGP question from last week. Hmm. I have no idea what is the APGP question from last week about. 
Like, hmm. Uh, I don't think so, Claire. I I I'm not sure how the how an ant come up with a homebound uh homebound path, but the this rub the path with a finger thing right is because ants uh they they produce this thing called I think called pheromones, and so they will they will plant pheromones 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 so they will pick up pheromones from either themselves or other ants as they move. So if you were to rub away the pheromones, it will take a while for them to find another familiar pheromone so that they can go back to their nest. I think homebound uh, path works in a different way from the pheromones. Yep, I'm mechanical engineering. You know, I was so confused just now, Claire, by your by this uh, rub by a finger thing. Because I thought, because for this, you know, the boy, the boy is going to be lifting up the ant and then placing it four units. So I was wondering, huh? You know, did I did I misread something about this question? Did the boy actually uh like rub the ant or something? So anyway, the last part of this question B, um, B is not exactly very very difficult, okay, but B. B, um, you, you need to trace and follow through what the question tells you in order for you to do something that is like B. Okay, so for B, right? Mm -hmm. For B, the end is going to be at the position 4, 3, 0. Let me draw out the path. So according to the question, right? The end is going to be at the point four three zero okay at the point at the point four three zero which means that with respect to the origin for example let's say the origin is here the nest is here that means um the homebound vector should be this vector when this vector this homebound vector according to the question this homebound vector is h so h because here to here is four three zero so from here to here it should be a minus 4, minus 3, 0. This is the homebound vector that n is supposed to be traveling. And then the boy pick up the n and displace it 4 units in the negative i direction. So from here, the n will be moved by minus 4, 0, 0. Okay. Then the n will attempt to move again. And this time, lambda h. So you will move again for a particular distance, lambda h. So this, sorry, for a particular distance, and this vector here is lambda h. So we have a lambda h here, which is equal to lambda of minus 4, minus 3, 0. But please remember to add a negative here, okay? Because the coordinates that are given here, this coordinate will be like O, A. And the homebound vector will be like a o, so it has to be negative of o a. Okay, that's why it's negative four, negative three, zero. And then from here, the let, let me call this point. Let's say d. Okay, from here, the end is supposed to go back this way if it is the shortest possible distance. Okay, so the end is supposed to be doing this, but uh, it's going to just move, 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 move. You know, like what <coughs> that like what that is drawn. And the actual distance is going to be 2.4 of this shortest possible distance. So um, let me first find this DO. I suddenly I was disconnected. But anyway, I'm back. And um, hang on, just let me check and make sure that I'm back. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so so I was saying that um it is gonna go from here to here, which is four three zero. 
Then after that, from here to here, it will be minus 4, 0, 0. Then from here to here, that will be lambda h. So it will be lambda of minus 4, minus 3, 0. Okay, this vector. <laughs> and that will end and that will help me to end up with d and this will give me vector o d okay so i here is i took this path plus this path plus this path it gives me o d so d o will be negative of this uh so sorry i mean i'm back so you can't take over <laughs> <clears throat> so um do if i were to simplify this this is going to be equal to 4 lambda then after that minus 3 plus 3 lambda then 0 with do will be this and what we want to do is to find the value of lambda such that the total distance that is traveled by the end is going to be the minimum possible what is the value of lambda so that the distance traveled by the end is minimum possible the distance that is traveled by the end will be this and then this path okay so for this um for the total distance let me go for t for example so the total distance will be this distance which is modulus of lambda h then plus 2.4 of modulus of do okay this is going to be the total distance that the end will take to go back to the nest which means that modulus of lambda it will be <coughs> sorry modulus of lambda h it will be square root of hmm, minus 4 lambda square plus minus 3 lambda square plus 0 square then plus 2.4 of modulus of do, it will be square root of 4 lambda square. Then minus 3 plus 3 lambda square and 0 square. If you were to simplify this, this is going to be square root of 25 lambda square. Then plus 2.4 square root of uh, the minimal simple I mean minimal simplification we have this plus 3 lambda square and to find the minimum t we have, since we have the equation over here let's just press this into the calculator we will press this in the calculator and let our calculator find for us the minimum I have done that let me show you what I've gotten on my calculator so I'm literally going to be pressing <coughs> this into my calculator Yeah, I'll just press this entire equation into my calculator and I'll generate a graph. The graph is this. Let me show you. Because the question didn't mention that we need to use differentiation or whatever strategy so we can use whatever that we want. So we will press this into the calculator so we know that the minimum happens here. So from our GC, we know that... Um, when lambda is equal to here, 0 0.140, then the distance is going to be the minimum. So t is a minimum. Okay, <clears throat> that's it for this question. Okay, by the way, um, maximum minimum question need not be solved using differentiation. Okay, I hope you guys know so because I've seen um it coming out in one of the one of the j1 promos in a, i mean a few years ago where the comment by the teacher was that uh, a lot of students they just simply go and do differentiation right? and you will realize right that many times if it is a differentiation application question for maximum minimum the question will actually say by using differentiation find a maximum or minimum but right? you can take a look at those questions they will actually mention this by maximum or minimum I mean, sorry, by using differentiation. If, you, if they intend for you to use differentiation, they will either use the word by using differentiation or they will throw in a few more um, constants as algebra so that you cannot press it directly to your calculator. 
and that makes it that makes the only way for you to continue to find maximum minimum also to in the end become a differentiation process okay, but if not right maximum minimum question can be very quickly solved by drawing the graph where okay, it is the fastest possible you can definitely try to do differentiation t is equal to this then you do a differentiation let dt d find a dt d lambda let dt be let dt d lambda be equal to zero then find the value of lambda and like what this question just mentioned here right you do not need to verify the nature of the minimum point so you can just let you can just find the value of lambda that cause dt d lambda be equal to zero and you don't have to do the second derivative or whatever but if you can just draw the graph and producing the graph into your solution you can already get the marks immediately it is four marks and i think it is really more than enough things that we have written so far right to acquire three to four marks so this should be definitely good enough as a set of solution okay i guess this is a good timing especially i know um that almost all of you right will be having <coughs> your paper on monday so